Eto na po. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tectica. Share sound screen. Teka po. Uh, hindi, hindi maririnig yung uh, ano. Let's uh, we will play it again. Uh, teka lang. Ipifix ko lang yung sa setting. Tar. Dear fellow educators, peasant activists, and all webinar participants, warmest greetings of solidarity to all of you. Thank you for inviting me to speak in this webinar on the semi-feudal mode of production in the Philippines in the light of national and international developments. I appreciate most highly the Congress of Teachers and Educators for Nationalism and Democracy and the Kilusang Magbubukid ng Pilipinas for co-sponsoring this webinar and inviting me as speaker. It is timely and fitting to discuss the subject of semi-feudalism and focus on the major role of the peasant masses and agriculture in the Philippine economy and society within the peasant uh, month. The peasant masses are still the most numerous class in the Philippines and are a decisive factor in the economic development and fundamental social transformation of the Philippines. I propose to describe the semi-feudal mode of production in the Philippines, the national and international factors that have caused this basic character of the Philippine economy, the crucial importance and consequence of describing this economy and the prospect of changing it through social and economic reforms or the revolutionary overthrow of the ruling system. The question of semi-feudalism is not uh, a new one. Filipino national democratic activists have been delving studiously into the country's basic problems of imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism since the late 1930s and early 1960s. Inspired and guided by Marxist-Leninist theory, particularly by Mao's works on Chinese society and revolution, and being mindful of the Philippines' own history and current circumstances, many of us undertook in-depth research and published essays on the country's long-standing agrarian problem and its links with neo-colonialism. These were reflected in my essays compiled into the book Struggle for National Democracy and later in the Philippine Society and Revolution, which helped uh, activists grasp the crucial role of semi-feudalism and the peasantry as a main force in the People's Democratic Revolution. Throughout the 1970s, this understanding was further validated and deepened through regional and rural social investigation reports and thus served to guide the national democratic movement in expanding and consolidating nationwide, especially among the peasantry. But as the Philippines entered the decade of the 1980s, there emerged the erroneous line among certain CPP leaders that the Philippine economy was no longer semi-feudal but industrial capitalist. Thus, although I was still in, Mar in uh, the prison of Marcos, my wife Julie and I collaborated to update our knowledge of the Philippine economy, debunk the Marcos-inspired and Trotskyite-driven notions about the country being already capitalist and reaffirm the basic conclusions about the semi-feudal mode of production. We call the economy or mode of production in the Philippines 
semi-feudal because it consists of certain forces and relations of production. The forces of production include the people in production, their means of production. The relations pertain to the ownership of the means of production, the organization of production, and the distribution of the product. As used by Marxists in the material study of history and political economy, these are precise terms and categories that describe the level of socioeconomic development of particular societies. But as these are verifiable and measurable by social science, I'm confident that many historians and political economists in the bourgeois academic milieu have also become familiar with these and use them to some degree to better understand the Philippines' historical and current conditions. The agriculture, industry, and service sectors of the Philippines are all dependent on the importation of capital goods as well as intermediate goods in varying degrees in order to operate. These include mechanical, electromechanical, and electronic equipment, fuels, chemicals, and agricultural inputs. These are required in order to operate the said feudal types of production. The importation of these capital goods is paid for by the exportation of certain agricultural crops, mineral ores, semi-manufacturers, and cheap labor in the form of live men and women. These exports are, however, never enough, and there is a perennial and growing trade deficit which is uh, paid for with mounting foreign debt and direct investments which only entrench and worsen the problem. So long as the aforesaid capital goods at the core of the Philippine forces of production are not reconstituted and harnessed to produce capital equipment, regenerate themselves and build a robust domestic capital goods industry, then there could be no genuine industrialization that will naturally emerge from the present neo-colonial pattern of trade. The Philippines lacks an industrial foundation and cannot be considered industrial capitalist despite the baseless claim of bourgeois economists that it has become a newly industrialized country. It has rich mineral resources, but these are merely extracted and exported to industrial capitalist economies. It has not developed metallurgy beyond the stage of primary processing or the mere extraction of mineral ores, and it has no capacity for for producing steel and other basic metals, machine tools, precision instruments, and other basic means of industrial production. All subsectors of the industry sector, mining and quarrying, construction and refining of imported crude oil, assembly of cars and ships, electronics assembly, production of cement, chemicals and fertilizers, garments, industrial food and beverage processing, reshaping of imported plates, tubes and steel rods and other metals and so on are grossly dependent on imported electromechanical equipment, uh, fuel, fuel and components prefabricated abroad. In recent decades, imported industrial inputs began to include digital tech tools dependent on expensive software and other heavily protected intellectual property, such as patents, which are controlled by imperialist firms to prevent unauthorized technology transfer. What is passed off as manufacturing in electronics and transport equipment, cars, trucks, motorcycles, and ships, is merely assembly of finished parts and components from abroad. What is passed off as shipbuilding is mainly welding of parts prefabricated abroad. What is passed off as steel industry is merely the reshaping of imported metal plates, tubes, and rods. All these kinds of semi-manufacturing or processing are run by foreign monopoly firms. These are privileged to have export processing or special economic zones, which are used for tax evasion and for smuggling, not only knockdowns, but also complete products, especially cars and motorcycles. The tax privileges in, are granted to foreign investors are incentives for them to re-export their products and sell a certain amount of seconds to the local market. The imperialist defenders and other apologists of neoliberal policy also claim that globalization is opening up alternative paths to industrialization by allowing backward countries to jumpstart economic growth by leveraging their local advantages in labor, services, strategic natural resources, 
and location, and, and even as tourist and tax havens, all in partnership with imperialist countries. Since the Asian financial crisis of 1997, there has been a sharp reduction in the assembly of semiconductors for re-export. Recently, the so-called shipbuilding by Hanjin and Subic has been closed down. The reassembly of Japanese cars and motorcycles has also been drastically reduced. The crisis of overproduction in the entire world capitalist system is relentlessly assaulting this floating kind of industrial enterprises that have their foundation outside of the Philippines. The imperialists have increasingly relied on digital speed-ups in product redesign, rapid retooling and use of robotics in automated handling, and con containerization in endless attempts to reconfigure their global supply chains. But as the crisis becomes more globalized than ever, even this advantage turns into its opposite. To conjure the illusion that the Philippines is a newly industrialized country, the World Bank statistics for 2019 understate the GDP share of agriculture at 7.4% and its employment share at 22.9%. Overstate the share of industry at 34% and its share of employment at 19.1% and shoot through the roof by overstating the share of the service sector at 58.6% and its employment share at 58%. However, the GDP share of the industry sector has supposedly declined despite its rise relative to the GDP share of agriculture. This decline is due to re the reduction of semi-manufacturing of semiconductors and assembly of vehicles as a result of global overproduction and stagnation, the rampant smuggling out of mineral ores and logs, and the smuggling of all kinds of manufacturers through the export processing zones, customs, and the Philippines' long coastline. The shares of GDP and employment of what are the basic productive sectors of agriculture and industry are supposed to have declined since 1980, but the shares of GDP and employment of the service sector are supposed to have grown rapidly due to increased activity in trading and finance, business processing, operations, tourism, the export of cheap labor amounting to 12 million or 26% of the total labor force of 45 million and the employment of ad or ad jobbing of 40% of the labor force in the informal sector of the economy. The extremely bloated service sector of the Philippine economy is not the outcome of an industrial capitalist economy. Rather, it is the extension of an agriculture-based comprador capitalism exporting some commercial crops, mineral ores, prettified handicrafts, and cheap labor by the millions, and always begging for foreign loans to cover the deficits in trade and balance of payments Two, to the inadequate income from raw material exports and the foreign exchange remittances of the documented and undocumented Filipino migrant workers. In the other direction, the same comprador capitalism extends its import operations into consumer-driven local commercial and real estate operations, including tourism and travel. What we see is the grotesque image of an agriculture-based and big comprador oriented economy with a bloated service sector. This pattern of a semi-feudal economy is not peculiar to the Philippines, but is seen in many other backward countries, as confirmed by UN statistics. The share of agriculture is easily understated by the bourgeois economists and statisticians because the reactionary government does not take into account what the peasants and farm workers consume from their own labor and what they produce in handicrafts, forestry, Sweden farming, hunting, backyard animal husbandry, fishing occupations and other sideline occupations to augment their incomes from tilling the soil. These peasant products remain within the household or within informal local markets and thus circulate beneath the radar of bourgeois statistics. The number of peasants is also understated 
Only the family heads and the children of 15 years and above are merely estimated, disregarding the fact that the entire family, except the toddlers, work as a productive force. In the statistics of the reactionary government, family members other than the family head are lumped together under the supraclass category of unpaid family workers. In fact, the traditional seasonal farm workers who are not attached to any degree of farm mechanization are still members of poor and lower middle peasant households, even as they are discounted as peasants in the estimates of the reactionary government st statisticians. Despite the misrepresentation of the Philippines as a newly industrialized country and the deliberate understatement of the peasant population, the reactionary government's bourgeois economists and statisticians admit that the rural population is more than 60% of the total Philippine population and that the Philippine economy is still agriculture-based but in the process of becoming newly industrialized. The urban areas of Manila Rizal, Central Luzon, and Southern Luzon swell with most of the country's odd jobbers either swelling in urban slums or commuting daily from nearby rural villages. This official estimate of the Philippine Statistics Authority that the rural population is 54.7% of the total population is most questionable and requires ground level validation and recomputation because the Philippine Statistics Authority uses a mechanical definition and superficial criteria for classifying barangays as urban. According to government guidelines, for example, a barangay with at least five establishments employing at least 10 employees, each say a rice mill, two agricultural supply stores, and two poultry farms, and at least five facilities. Uh, like a, a trading post, a plaza, a chapel, a school, and cell phone signal, two kilometers or less from the barangay hall is already considered as urban barangay. The gravity of the underdeveloped agrarian, pre-industrial, and semi-feudal character of the Philippine economy is well manifested by the chronic severity of unemployment, underemployment, and overseas work, as shown by official government statistics. Based on 2019 annual labor and employment estimates, 72.9 million of, uh, Filipinos are considered of working age, 15 years old and over, but only 44.7 million is counted as the labor force. Thus, over 28 million are of working age, but not in the labor force. Among those excluded from the labor force are an estimated 9 million of these who are at school and another 19 million of working age and fully un unemployed, including those working overseas. Officially estimated at only 2.2 million, most are out of school youth, housekeepers, mostly women, and others who have stopped looking for work for various reasons. In the formal labor force, some 2.23 million are fully unemployed and another 5.9 million are underemployed, defined as employed but looking for more hours of work. Thus, the total unemployment, including underemployment, reached more than 27 million as of 2019. This is 60.4% of the total labor force of 44.7 million. This is even worse than the other internationally circulated official figures of 10 million or 22% of the total labor force of 45 million are unemployed and another 12 million are documented and undocumented migrant workers or 26% amounting to 12 to 48%. All types of unemployment have further <coughs> spiked up to higher levels this year due to the COVID-19 lockdowns. The gravity of the underdeveloped and semi-feudal character of the Philippine economy is underscored by the fact that a huge chunk of the labor force have to separate from their families to seek jobs abroad. It can be assumed that those who seek and take jobs abroad do so because of job scarcity in the Philippines. They are as much unemployed by the Philippine economy like those many employables who take odd jobs in the so-called informal economy or who have given up looking for a job in their own country. 
If the Philippines were truly a newly industrialized country, as South Korea and Taiwan and some Southeast Asian countries had been in the 1970s and 1980s, there would even be a labor shortage in the Philippines. It is not possible for the Philippines to have become industrial capitalist or newly industrialized economy because never has the reactionary government implemented genuine land reform and national industrialization in any period, be it in the period of foreign exchange controls and acclaimed promotion of import substitution industries in the 1950s or in any later period in which the economic policy would become even more adverse to national industrialization in the Philippines. As the basic productive sectors, agriculture and industry decline and the population grows, the reserve army of labor, the unemployed, grows and struggles for odd jobs in both rural and urban areas and those who can speak English hunger for jobs abroad. Frustrated with failure to get adequate employment, the growing mass of unemployed can also be an abundant source of revolutionary activists and red fighters. The revolutionary movement can never run short of recruits in the face of the worsening crisis of the domestic ruling system and the world capitalist system and the declining opportunities for employment. The relations of production describe best the semi-feudal character of the Philippine mode of production. The chief ruling class is no longer the traditional rent-collecting landlord class of feudal times. It is the Comprador Big Bourgeoisie which is the chief financial and trading agent of foreign monopoly capitalism and owns the big banks, export-import companies, shopping malls, construction, real estate companies, and the like. At the same time, it owns the largest haciendas and related agribusinesses, including livestock and poultry farms, fishing fleets, agroforestry schemes, and stocks in mining companies to assure itself of primary commodities for export in exchange for the manufacturers that in imports. The Comprador Big Bourgeoisie is often called the Big Comprador Landlord class to emphasize its semi-feudal character, its hybrid character as merchant capitalist and feudal owner of haciendas. It engages in manufacturing, but it imports the majority of its means of production, the fuel and most major components of the total product. It uses some amount of mechanization in its haciendas, but continues to use the cheap labor of seasonal farm workers and collects from the widespread traditional rent collecting landlords a large amount of agricultural surplus for local processing, domestic trade, and export. It has the biggest amount of bribe money to determine the big comprador character of the, big, of the high bureaucrat capitalist, as well as the results of elections at the national, regional, provincial, and city levels. According to the latest figures, uh, the 30 biggest uh, of the Comprador Big Bourgeois in the Philippines are as follows, with their corresponding amounts of wealth in billions of US dollars. Uh, the heirs of uh, Henry C, or the C siblings with 13.9 billion uh, dollars, Man Manuel Villar with uh, five billion dollars, Enrique Rathon Jr. with $4.3 billion, uh, Lance Gokongwe and siblings with $4.1 billion, uh, Jaime Sobel de Alla with $3.6 billion, Andrew Tan with $2.3 billion, uh, Lucio Tan with $2.2 billion, Ramon Ang of San Miguel Brewery with uh, two billion dollars, uh, Tony Tan Kaptiong with 1.9, and uh, Lucio and uh, Susan Co with 1.7 uh, uh, billion dollars. I shall not uh, mention all the other 20 uh, to, uh, I know in order not to bore you, uh, you can look at the text. To, to know all the, the rest of the big compradors, but I just want to give you uh, the, the human faces of these big compradors. Um, as individuals, the biggest compradors show only the tip of the immense wealth accumulated by their families and family-based business blocks. They have interlocking interests and interlocking directorates 
in the biggest uh, Comprador firms. They engage in, in, in syndicates, mergers, in mergers, uh, swaps and intermarriages. Um, the intermarriage, in the intermarriages are what uh, Karl Marx called uh, the uh, prostitution uh, among the bourgeois. The biggest of the Comprador firms are as follows. Um, SM Investments uh, Corporation and subsidiaries uh, that shows that uh, uh, the foreign exchange remittances of the overseas Filipino workers uh, uh, go mainly to the pocket of Henry C. Uh, number two, Ayala Corporation subsidiaries, uh, three uh, top frontier investment holdings incorporated and subsidiaries, San Miguel Corporation and subsidiaries, Ayala Land um, and subsidiaries, uh, SM, uh, Prime Holdings and subsidiaries, uh, Banco de Oro, Unibank uh, Incorporated and subsidiaries, Aboitis Equity Ventures Incorporated and subsidiaries, uh, San Miguel Food and Beverage uh, and subsidiaries, uh, uh, JG Summit Holdings and subsidiaries. I will not list, I will not uh, uh, read the, li the rest of uh, the list. Uh, uh, there are 20 uh, more big comprador firms. Uh, I suggest that you look at the text of my uh, uh, speech to know the, the rest of the big comprador firms. When the big compradors are based in Metro Manila and other major cities, the far more numerous rent-collecting traditional landlords and related merchant usurers, land speculators and promoters of contract growing are based in the countryside, including the minor cities and less urbanized poblaciones. The traditional landlords retain their dominance in the localities with their ownership of most of the agricultural land and related agri-based assets like uh, rice mills, warehouses, trucking and the like. Their command over the votes of the tenants, farm workers, other employees and their dependents and consequently their preeminence in the local reactionary governments. They are the base of most of the dynasties at the regional, provincial and municipal levels. All land reform programs undertaken by the U.S. colonial regime and by the Philippine uh, semi-colony or neo-colony have proven to be bogus in the sense that the redistribution price for the expropriated lands is unaffordable, unaffordable to the tenants because the reactionary government officials connive with the landlords to raise the expropriation price for their corrupt mutual benefit at the expense of the tenants. Eventually, the expropriated land falls into the hands of old running or newly rising landlords from the ranks of bureaucrats, rich peasants, merchants, usurers, and professionals uh, when the land is uh, auctioned off. Uh, usually, the so-called land reform beneficiaries uh, have to sell out when there is a a serious illness of one member of the family or uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, serious damage to the crop because of natural calamity. That's how the uh, uh, so-called uh, land reform beneficiaries get busted and uh, their tenurial rights are sold to, uh, to other uh, people with uh, more money. Uh, uh, at any rate, any kind of bourgeois land reform goes back to renewed and accumulation by a few in the absence of national industrialization as outlet for investing the landlord income from the agricultural surplus. In semi-feudalism, there is a vicious cycle of comprador capitalism and feudalism in the absence of a determined and systematic policy of implementing genuine land reform and national industrialization in combination and coordination. The natural economy of feudalism, characterized by local or regional self-sufficiency, was eroded in the 19th century, especially in the transition from the Manila-Acapulco galleon trade to the more expanded Philippine-European trade after the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. This was due to crop specialization in either export crops, 
uh, abaca, tobacco, uh, sugar cane, coconut, and the like, or food staples, uh, mainly rice and corn, for domestic consumption. The accelerated growth of towns and inter-island trade and the spread of the capitalist commodity system of production and exchange with the use of money. In the period of its direct colonial rule and with such devices as the Payne Aldrich Act, the U.S. made sure that the Philippines paid taxes for its colonial status and remained a profitable source of raw materials and market for surplus manufacturers. It developed further the semi-feudal character of the Philippine economy by expanding agricultural production for export, opening the mines, building more roads and bridges, and establishing the public school system. It carried out land reform to break up the large Spanish friar states, but the poor tenants could not afford the redistribution price, and these state, estates passed on to the native and mestizo uh, big comprador landlords and to the many more traditional uh, landlords, uh, including some leaders of the old democratic revolution like uh, the Aguinaldos and the Tria, Tironas, the Aranetas, and so on. Uh, they were the um, uh, uh, end beneficiaries of the American land reform program. In the transition from feudalism, to semi-feudalism since the 19th century, it was inevitable for handicrafts and pre-industrial manufacturing based on the processing of local raw materials with the use of hand tools to develop further under the stimulus of inter-island trade. In the U.S. colonial period, machinery for large-scale production in food and beverages, textile and shoe manufacturing cordage, paper, and others were imported and inspired the small national bourgeoisie and its advocates to aspire for national industrialization and nationalization of the economy. But there has never been any serious plan or effort by the U.S. colonial regime, nor the semi-colonial puppet Filipino regimes from Rojas to Duterte to build the industrial foundation of the Philippines. There has never been any plan to develop metallurgy, especially of iron and steel, beyond the level of extracting the mineral ores of the Philippines for export, or to build the machine tool industry for the industrialization of the Philippines beyond the level of repairs, reconditioning, and producing minor parts of imported machines. There has also been extremely limited processing of locally available materials to produce construction materials, aside from cement, logs, and bricks, industrial chemicals, and pharmaceuticals. After World War II, the Philippines became a semi-colony. The U.S. made sure to grant nominal independence only if the Filipino puppet leaders, headed by Rojas, signed the U.S. RP Treaty of General Relations, <coughs> making the Philippines subservient to the, U to the U.S economically, politically, culturally, and militarily. U.S. corporations and citizens retained their property rights and were guaranteed so-called parity rights or equality with Filipinos. In the exploitation of natural resources and in the operation of public utilities and all types of businesses, the U.S. made the overt threat that it would not pay for war damage compensation if it did not get its so-called uh, parity rights. You know very well that the uh, U.S. armed forces destroyed as much, um, uh, even more than uh, uh, the properties destroyed by the Japanese. Um, they practically destroyed the city of Manila. The reactionary government officials, academics, and press pundits hoped that the Philippines would be rehabilitated and developed with the use of U.S. and Japanese war damage payments. They spoke of building new and necessary industries, especially under the auspices of the Rehabilitation Finance Corporation, other state banks, and the National, Develop and the National Development Corporation. But the larger fact was that the U.S. Com companies became the main beneficiaries of war damage payments and loans from the U.S. Export-Import Bank, which were used to rebuild their trading firms and their subsidiaries manufacturing household consumables from uh, locally available raw materials. 
The U.S. monopoly firm swamped the country with its surplus goods and pushed the national bourgeoisie to the margins when the rehabilitation funds were depleted by paying for the reconstruction of U.S. firms and for imported consumption goods by 1949, the U.S. allowed the Philippine puppet government to adopt a policy of foreign exchange controls within the framework and control of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the U.S. Export-Import Bank. The foreign exchange control was later prettified at best by President Garcia as an instrument for favoring Filipino businessmen in the name of developing the Philippine economy with import substitution industries under the so-called Filipino First Policy. He renamed the RFC, the development of the Bank of the Philippines in 1959. He had economic nationalists in his cabinet, however, the, the declared good intentions of Garcia did not result in the industrialization of the Philippines. At best, the efforts of nationalist economists and business groups created some space for certain light and intermediate local industries to supply some domestic needs, but were still dependent on imported machinery and subject to licenses and patent rights held by foreign companies. Even beyond the Garcia regime, the Filipino first policy also inspired uh, the Filipino big compradors, the taking over of the Meralco in 1962 and the PLDT in 1967 from their American owners. But of course, the equipment and fuel for generating power would continue to come from U.S. companies. Soon enough, the U.S. scrapped the foreign exchange controls by having Makapagal elected president in 1961 and using him to adopt the decontrol policy, reaffirm the Laurel Langley Agreement, and promote free enterprise. At the same time, Makapagal still wanted to present himself as being interested in the industrial development of the Philippines. Thus, he launched his land reform program and the showpiece uh, illegal integrated steel mills in northern Mindanao with funding mainly from the Japanese banks and steel monopoly firms. Despite the brave words of declaring land tenancy as anathema to public policy and economic development and formally abolishing land tenancy, the land reform program proved to be bogus as it required the land reform beneficiaries to pay the redistribution price that they could not afford. The ISMI also flopped eventually as the Japanese creditors and steel makers made the firm import finished steel plates, rods and tubes from Japan for May reshaping. The illegal project became known eventually as a beauty parlor that merely curled metal plates to make galvanized iron sheets for the roofs of Philippine buildings and homes. The economic technocrats of Makapagal echoed the U.S. economist Walt Rostow and boasted that the Philippines was already on the takeoff stage of economic development. They were most enthusiastic about the designs and feasibility studies for infrastructure projects under the auspices of the World Bank. With Makapagal failing to win a second term, it would be Marcos taking advantage of the said designs and feasibility studies. By the 1960s, Japan had recovered from the devastation of its industries and was enjoying an industrial boom. It was brimming over with surplus goods to dump on the Philippines, which received these together with the surplus goods from the U.S. The reactionary wisdom then was not to industrialize the Philippines because its so-called comparative advantage was in selling mineral ores, logs, and bananas to Japan. The same anti-industrial thinking persisted even when the U.S. and Japan agreed in the 1970s to allow capitalist-style land reform and on that basis industrialized Taiwan and South Korea as frontliners and show windows against the socialist industrialization of China and North Korea. The economic policy of the Marcos regime was blatantly against land reform and national industrialization. He took his presidency as an opportunity to engage in pork barrel corruption of unprecedented colossal proportions. Thus, he seized on the neo keynesian line of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank to build roads, bridges, and ports to enhance the infrastructure for exporting mineral ores 
logs and plantation crops and importing construction equipment and materials and consumer goods. The infrastructure projects were overpriced and were contracted to Marcos Crony corporations. The war damage payments from Japan were exhausted and huge amounts of foreign loans were incurred from Japan, the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank. The Marcos regime touted the infrastructure projects and some 11 corporations supplying financial and engineering services and some local construction materials like cement, rocks, wood products and the like as instruments and outcomes of national industrialization. Major banks were hyped as universal banks, providing not only commercial credit, but also loans for industrialization. In the late 1970s, the export processing zones for reassembly and fringe processing were also celebrated as the cutting edge of industrialization. The Marcos regime started to fall into financial trouble in 1979 because of excessive spending and borrowing for infrastructure projects and tourist facilities. His crony construction companies were also scrambling for a share of con contracts in the construction projects fueled by petrodollars in the Middle East, exactly at this time when Marcos was in trouble with his pork barrel economics. Some elements headed by Ricardo Reyes within the leadership of the Communist Party of the Philippines concurred with the Marcos propaganda, misrepresenting the Philippine economy as industrial capitalist and spread the subjectivist line that the Philippine economy was no longer semi-feudal. This subjectivist line resulted in undermining the general line of people's democratic revolution through protracted people's war and in bringing about right opportunism in the so-called new uh, Katipunan program of the National uh, uh, Democratic uh, Front of the Philippines. Uh, this was promoted by the, what uh, those who called, by those who called themselves uh, Popdems, or uh, sometimes they call Popdems, and much worse in several left opportunist lines. Uh, the subjectivist uh, uh, line would be um, uh, manifested and applied, which were pushed, uh, these were pushed uh, by Trotskyite elements in Metro Manila, like Popoy Lagman and uh, in Mindanao, Ricardo Reyes himself and Nathan Kimpo and touted urban insurrectionism as the lead factor in the armed revolution without the necessity of protracted people's war by a bailing of the countryside to encircle the cities. Where the biggest damage to the revolution occurred, the line of people's strikes in urban areas and intensified city partisan warfare was pushed in combination with the premature formation of larger new people's army units to serve as mere adjuncts of the urban actions in certain regions. The line prematurely and necessarily exposed the under, uh, revolutionary underground uh, in the Bau City, for instance, uh, where uh, Edgar Hobson was, uh, was killed, no? and, uh, and uh, the People's Army was pushed to create too many military companies and to neglect the deployment of enough platoons and squads for keeping and expanding the mass base. After the downfall of Marcos in 1986, the Korea Kino regime was overburdened by the foreign debts that had been incurred by Marcos. And yet, following U.S. and IMF diktat, it preserved the dictator's onerous presidential decree 1177, imposing automatic appropriation for debt service payments and adopted the policy of paying for odious foreign debts, like those incurred for the showy but ill-conceived Bataan nuclear power plant that had been cancelled for gross anomalies in financial technical and environmental calculations. The Aquino regime shifted to increased domestic public borrowing. It also complied with the neoliberal policy of the U.S. by adopting the policy of import liberalization, meaning to say expanded importation of foreign manufacturers with much less foreign loans to finance grandiose infrastructure projects and conjure the illusion of development. The semi-feudal character of the Philippine economy became more exposed than ever under the presidency of Cory Aquino. Despite the strong clamor 
from an unprecedented alliance of peasant organizations with strong support from middle forces, the Ascendera Coriaquino preserved the reactionary tradition of imposing a bogus land reform law via a compliant constitutional con commission that made expropriation of land a voluntary act of the landlord and uh, via a reactionary congress of big girl landlords and comprador bourgeois who limited the appropriation of funds for land reform and worsened the oppression of the masses of peasants and farm workers. It was during the term of Ramos when the U.S. and its imperialist allies, especially Japan, decided to loosen up commercial credit for financing private construction in an unprecedented way in the whole of Asia, including the Philippines. In the same period, the U.S. further ensured hostaging the Philippine Central Bank to the U.S.-dominated global private central banking cartel via Republic Act No. 7653, the new Central Bank Act in 1993. The money flowed to the construction of high-rise office and residential buildings and tourist facilities from 1994 onwards until the Asian financial crisis of 1997. In conformity with neoliberalism and with the supposed comparative advantage of the Philippines in raw material production, the Ramos regime did not undertake any basic or heavy industrial project that had any semblance of building the industrial foundation of the Philippines. Instead, in line with privatization under the neoliberal policy, he sold off the productive assets of state corporations, including the already decrepit illegal integrated steel mills, to a Malaysian Chinese company just to finance housekeeping operations of his government increase military appropriations in the name of modernization and uh, reduce the budgetary deficit. Public assets like the former U.S. military bases, Clark Subic and John Hay, uh, the Fort Bonifacio Reservation and the Manila Bay Reclamation projects was all, were also thrown wide open to real estate development for tourist and other non-industrial business facilities. The Asian financial crisis of 1997 devastated not only the erstwhile <coughs> private construction boom, but even the semi-manufacturing of semiconductors and garments. This would be revived after a few years later, but this time subordinated to China as the final platform of a reassembly prior to the export of the products of the US and other Western markets. The economic tigers of Southeast Asia became emaciated kittens. The succeeding Estrada regime, 1998 to 19, and 2001, was unstable for lack of public funds and was overthrown for raiding the social insurance systems for government and private em employees in corrupt lending schemes to his cronies. China became the main partner of U.S. imperialism in promoting and taking uh, advantage of the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization. Once more, there was a rising industrial capitalist country in Asia, a gigantic one at that, which made it easy for the reactionary policymakers and economists in the Philippines to invoke so-called comparative advantage as a reason to stay underdeveloped and semi-feudal and to shun national industrialization. Sure enough, Chinese manufacturing firms as well as US, Japanese, and other foreign companies in China would enjoy dumping their manufacturers in the Philippines. The Arroyo and Noy Noy Aquino regimes were bound by the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization. They did not undertake any project for the industrialization of the Philippine economy, but they improved the financial uh, standing of their administ administrations by benefiting from quantitative easing of credit by the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve System and the consequent flow of portfolio investments or speculative capital from the U.S. and other foreign hedge funds, raising the value-added tax by taking more foreign loans and, of course, by taking advantage of the growing foreign exchange earnings from overseas contract workers and call centers. 
Since Duterte became president in 2016, the Philippine economy has deteriorated from, for, from year to year, and certainly no genuine land reform and national industrialization have been undertaken. Neither has the U.S. or any other imperialist power agreed to the industrialization of the Philippines, as had been done decades ago in Taiwan and South Korea. Duterte himself admits that he knows best how to kill people to solve problems, and that he knows nothing about economics except the pork barrel kind of economics, of which his idol Marcos said a mastery of, of for plundering the economy. Thus, the centerpiece of Duterte's economic plan is to beg China for high interest loans for overpriced infrastructure projects to be undertaken by Chinese contractors, Filipino Chinese subcontractors, and a predominantly Chinese workforce. But now, wonder of wonders, there is a new campaign by counter revolutionary elements, including Trotskyites and pseudo socialist clerical fascists to claim that the Philippines is industrial capitalist rather than semi-feudal or big comprador capitalist. Their ulterior motives shows when they claim that the People's Democratic Revolution through protracted People's War is a futile exercise and might as well be liquidated. But the CPP and the entire revolutionary movement assure them that easily more than 60% of the Philippine population is still in the countryside. This is a far cry from the less than 10% population of a definitely industrial capitalist country. The poor and middle peasant masses as a big ally of the working class are still there to provide the widest possible social and physical terrain for maneuver in a protracted people's war. Since its founding on December 26, 1968, the CPP has put forward the program for a People's Democratic Revolution on the basis of the critique of the Philippine society as semi-colonial and semi-feudal. The U.S. granted nominal independence to the Philippines in 1946, but retained it as a semi-colony through the U.S. RP Treaty of General Relations and subsequent treaties agreements and arrangements subordinating the Philippines to U.S. hegemony economically, politically, culturally, and militarily. The Philippine economy remains semi-feudal, dominated by U.S. monopoly capitalism and its major allies and subordinated to the world capitalist system, but run directly by the comprador big bourgeoisie, the landlord class, and the bureaucrat capitalist class. The Comprador Big Bourgeoisie is the chief financial and trading agent of the foreign monopolies, but has its own landed, mining, and manufacturing interests, keeps an alliance with the traditional rent-collecting landlords, and casts its influence on bureaucrat capitalists that have never decided at any time to carry out genuine land reform and national industrialization. The national bourgeoisie has weakened from its relatively stronger position before World War II. This is because of the flood of surplus consumer products from the U.S., dependence on U.S. trade policies and the depletion of foreign exchange by 1949, the neo-Keynesian policy of foreign borrowing for infrastructure projects, the flood of surplus manufacturers from Japan, and the newly industrialized countries elsewhere in East Asia, the neoliberal economic policy, and another flood of surplus manufacturers from China. The national industrialization of the Philippines has been effectively stopped within the framework of the IMF, World Bank, WTO, ADB, Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation, and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The Philippine Chamber of Industry, pre, uh, previously formed to promote the goal of industrialization, has been dominated by big compradors. The spokesmen of the national bourgeoisie in the Philippine Senate, like Senators Lorenzo Tanyada and Jose W. Giocno, have disappeared. Both houses of Congress have become entirely pork-barrel-minded, limited to thinking of economic development only in terms of graft-laden infrastructure projects. With the enactment of laws favoring foreign investments since the late 1960s, the enterprises of the national bourgeoisie were squeezed out. 
They persevere to a limited extent in the processing of food, tobacco, cotton, plant to fibers, wood, leather, and other locally available materials. On behalf of the Filipino working class in basic alliance with the peasantry, the CBP has taken the lead in advocating agrarian revolution and national industrialization within the context of the People's Democratic Revolution with a socialist perspective. This revolution seeks to break the grip of foreign monopoly capitalism on the Philippine economy and to deprive the exploiting classes of big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists of the power to control the economy. It is timely and of decisive importance that the CPP and the revolutionary movement are underscoring the need for genuine land reform and national industrialization because the neoliberal policy of the imperialist powers and client states is unraveling. This policy has let loose the unbridled greed of the monopoly bourgeoisie of the imperialist powers and has subjected the proletariat and peoples of the world to the worst forms of exploitation and oppression and wars of aggression in certain parts of the world. This is generating one crisis of overproduction after another on a worsening scale. The imperialist powers, their magnates and wizards, have failed to solve the ever-worsening crisis of overproduction and the prolonged stagnation of the world capital system that followed the global financial crash of 2007 to 2008. Before they can solve this crisis, another one that is worse has come on top of it. It has been further aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. This health crisis has triggered lockdowns and social panic across the world. It has devastated economies and has thrown people out of their jobs and other means of livelihood. And worst of all, counter-revolutionary states have taken advantage of the crisis to repress the people and the monopoly bourgeoisie to take multi-million dollar giveaways, couches, bailout loans, and stimulus packages and evade responsibilities to the mass of employees. The crisis of the world capitalist system has become so severe that the US and China, who are main partners in the implementation of the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization, are increasingly at odds with each other. The US accuses China of having cheated it with its two-tiered economy of state capitalism and private capitalism use of state planning to achieve strategic, economic, and military goals. The U.S. also decries China's use of state subsidies and currency manipulation to favor Chinese enterprises, and the theft of U.S. technology from U.S. companies and research laboratories. The two biggest imperialist powers are in a process of decoupling and entering a new world war. In all imperialist countries, the monopoly bourgeoisie is shaken by the worsening crisis of the world capitalist system. It is worried to death by its own inability to overcome the crisis and its fear of the rise of revolutionary mass movements among the workers and the people against escalating austerity measures and repression. Desperately, it is encouraging and supporting ultra-reactionary movements of fascist, chauvinist, racist, anti-migrant, misogynist, militarist, and anti-environmentalist character. It is actively co-opting people's initiatives and movements, and even fleshing out a strategy of tension and distraction through its long leash sleeper assets among the Al-Qaeda, Abu Sayyaf, Daesh, ISIS-type terrorist cells to outflank, hijack, deflect, and emasculate the growing revolutionary outrage of the world's peoples. Millions of Filipino migrant workers in more than 100 countries are now threatened by the worsening crisis of global capitalism and by the rising ultra-reactionary movements, especially in imperialist countries. Many of them have already been thrown out of their jobs because of the tightening of rules by host governments against them and by the lockdowns and shutdowns due to the COVID-19 pandemic. There is now a drastic reduction in the foreign exchange earnings of the migrant workers and the repatriation in increasing numbers is becoming a major problem. Meanwhile, in the Philippines, the semi-feudal economy is reeling 
from the decline of both the agriculture and industry sectors and the unsustainable bloating of the service sector and the public debt. The service sector and public debt bubbles are already in the process of implosion. The tyrannical Duterte regime aggravates the situation by mishandling its response to the COVID-19 pandemic and by taking advantage of it to grab more powers. Duterte and his fellow crooks in the top echelon of the bureaucracy and military engaged in the most brazen and outrageous forms of plunder. Thus, the crisis of the ruling system has worsened rapidly and is generating the most favorable conditions for mass protest and the people's war for national and social liberation. As the inter-imperialist contradictions of the U.S. and China are sharpening, the Duterte regime is desperately trying to serve two conflicting imperialist masters. It is still keeping the treaties, agreements, and arrangements that make the U.S. the most dominant imperialist power in the Philippines in an all-round way. In return, the U.S. is relying on the Duterte regime to carry out an anti-communist military campaign of suppression against the revolutionary movement and to make a charter change to allow U.S. corporations unlimited ownership of Philippine land, natural resources, public utilities, and all types of businesses. At the same time, Duterte has allowed China to build seven military bases in the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines in the West Philippine Sea in violation of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea and the 2016 final judgment of the Permanent Arbitration Court in favor of the Philippines against China. It has allowed China to own a number of Philippine islands through Chinese casino operators, control the national power grid, erect to sell towers in Philippine military camps and assist the reactionary armed services, AFP and PNP, in developing its communication system. Duterte commits all these acts of treason in exchange for bribes for taking out high interest China loans for overpriced infrastructure projects to be undertaken by Chinese contractors and their own workforce. He tries to benefit not only from official transactions with China and its state banks and corporations, but also from shady relations with Chinese criminal syndicates engaged in the smuggling of illegal drugs and other contraband, in online gaming and casino operations and in illegal Chinese immigration under the cover of casino employment and tourism. Corrupt Chinese officials are also using these criminal operations of Chinese triads for laundering and stashing their bureaucratic loot abroad. In the face of two conflicting imperialist powers trying to dominate the Philippines with the collaboration of the exploiting classes of big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists, the CPP and the revolutionary movement of the Filipino people expect a chronic crisis of the semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system to do to worsen at an accelerated rate. They are therefore more than ever determined to carry out the People's Democratic Revolution through protracted people's war. They are resolved that the People's Democratic Revolution can be completed and the Socialist Revolution can be started only upon the overthrow of the imperialist-supported big corporate landlord class dictatorship. In the course of the People's War, agrarian revolution can be carried out in substantial areas in the country, but the agrarian revolution and other socio-economic transition measures can be completed and the socialist transformation of the economy can be carried out in earnest only after the nationwide seizure of political power by the proletariat in alliance with the peasantry and other democratic social strata. By wielding state power, the proletariat shall be able to take over the commanding heights of the economy, meaning to say, take out the Philippine Central Bank from the global private central banking cartel of the big banksters and transform it into a genuine public central bank. Control the existing industries, the sources of raw materials and the communications and transport lines carry out socialist industrialization and complete the agrarian revolution in conjunction with the collectivization and mechanization of agriculture. 
But while the People's Democratic Revolution through protracted People's War is still in progress, the CPP has agreed with its revolutionary allies within the NDLP and with further allies and peace advocates outside of the NLP uh, to engage whenever possible and advantageous to the people in peace negotiations with the reactionary government to address the roots of the civil war with basic social, economic and political reforms in order to lay the basis for a just and lasting peace. The main purpose of peace negotiations the substantive agenda and the methods of negotiating and agreeing had been set forth in the Hague Joint Declaration of 1992. More than 10 agreements had been mutually approved, including the Joint Agreement on Safety and Immunity Guarantees, the Joint Agreement on Reciprocal Working Committees, and the Comprehensive Agreement on Respect for Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law, CARIL. Even the, the GRP and NDRP versions of the Comprehensive Agreement on Social and Economic Reforms, CASER, have been fully drafted and have led to substantial tentative agreements by the reciprocal working committees of both sides. But the U.S. imperialist officials and the most reactionary economic and military interests have been behind the scenes prompting the Philippine president to use the demand for indefinitely prolonged ceasefire in order to block the progress of the peace negotiations to paralyze the revolutionary movement and to stop the negotiations altogether. It is now obvious that every president has used the peace negotiations to consolidate his or her political position within the first year of rule and to try to wangle an indefinitely prolonged ceasefire to paralyze the revolutionary movement and steer the wider public discourse away from addressing substantive issues. But why do the CPP and NDRP continue to entertain the offer of peace negotiations by every incoming president of the reactionary government? Were the CPP and the NDRP to rebuff such offer, they would appear as the bellicose party in the eyes of a great number of people and a broad range of peace advocates. They would be playing the role of the ultra-leftist, infantile communist or the crazy Trotskyite who poses as pure and perfect proletarian revolutionary, isolated from the masses and helping the enemy appear as the lover of peace. It is the wise policy of the CPP and NDRP to avail of the peace negotiations as a way of presenting the program for a people's democratic revolution, urging all patriotic and democratic forces to explore the paths to a just and lasting peace and letting the enemy side unfold its anti-national, anti-democratic, and anti-people character. But is it entirely impossible for the adversaries in a civil war to negotiate and agree on a truce? It is not impossible. It has been demonstrated twice in the history of the Chinese Revolution that the Chinese Communist Party and the Kuomintang could negotiate and agree on a truce in order to fight a third party first against the Northern Warlords and then against the Japanese invaders. The CCP and the GMD even tried to negotiate in order to avert the resumption of the civil war after the defeat of Japan, but goaded and backed by the US, uh, the GMD or the Kuomintang uh, reactionaries decided to carry out a civil war, which they lost in 1949. Is it possible for the Philippine reactionary government to be led by a president or party that is patriotic and progressive enough to engage the serious peace negotiations with the NDFP to address the roots of the armed conflict, agree on social, economic and political reforms, and thereby lay the basis for a just and lasting peace? Such a possibility depends on the objective conditions, especially certain domestic and international factors that would hinder or enhance the peace process, and on the character and ability of said president to persuade the big cobradors and landlords to take the chance of carrying out land reform and national industrialization as done previously in certain countries. Among the presidents of the reactionary government, Duterte was the most loud-mouthed about seeking a just peace with the revolutionary movement, but he was merely pretending if not for his small-mindedness and short-sightedness, if not for his sheer stupidity and cowardice to stand his ground against a rapidly pro-U.S. and anti-people AFP, 
He could have proceeded with the NDFP enforcing the Caser in order to carry out land reform and national industrialization on a self-reliant basis with a further assurance of income from the oil and gas resources with an estimated value of $26 trillion. In the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines in the West Philippine Sea, but he has preferred to lay aside, in his own words, the 2016 judgment of the Permanent Arbitration Court in favor of the Philippines in accordance with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. His recent posturing at the UN General Assembly does not change this fact. Instead of playing his cards well to advance national sovereignty, he has acted as a traitor by letting China violate the sovereign rights of the Philippines and build seven artificial islands to serve as military bases, destroy the marine environment and claim, and claim the marine and mineral resources that belong to the Filipino people. He is still hoping to get huge amounts of bribes from the overpriced infrastructure projects and the high interest loans amounting to 24 billion US dollars that were promised by China. There are ultra reactionary, especially those who have a militarist mindset, who say that they do not need any peace negotiations with the NDRP to achieve peace and to develop the Philippine economy through genuine land reform and national industrialization. But indeed, if left to themselves, they will continue to follow the dictates of their imperialist masters and the local reactionary interest, and they will only drive the broad masses of the Filipino people to wage armed revolution and overthrow the semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system. The CPP and the NDFP have always given a fair chance to every reactionary government from that of Cory Aquino to that of Duterte to prove that the revolutionary movement is seriously interested in peace negotiations for the benefit of the Filipino people. Peace negotiations have always been broken because U.S. imperialism and the local ultra-reactionaries have always wanted to turn these into surrender negotiations at the expense of the revolutionary movement and the people, or at least to cause confusion among the ranks of the revolutionary movement and the people. But they cannot break the revolutionary will of the CPP and the NDFP and the Filipino people. This will is well expressed in the program of the People's Democratic Revolution and is further applied in the documents and drafts already made in the interest of the Filipino people in the course of the grp ndrp peace negotiations. The CPP and NDRP are always open to joint agreements with any force so long as these do not violate revolutionary principles and they spell out mutually agreeable policies for basic social, economic and political reforms that improve the situation and lives of the Filipino people and lead to the goal of a just and lasting peace in a Philippines that is independent, democratic, socially just, developing in an all-round way, prosperous, and in solidarity with the people of the world against imperialism and all reaction. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for um listening to the talk of um, Ka Kajoma. Um, we would like to um, remind everyone that um, uh, you could um, forward your questions um, in, in advance uh, in the chat box so that um, our main guests can, can um, prepare for, for the questions and read it um, in, in advance. Um, at this uh, point of time, uh, ano po, um, tatawagan po natin ang ating um, reactor um, na ano, mula sa mula sa kilosang uh, magbubukid ng, uh, ng, ng Pilipinas, um, si uh, Kapaeng Rafael Mariano, um, the chairperson um, Emer Emeritus of um, KMP. Um, Let's give him a round of applause, and he will um, present his uh, reaction to to the lecture of um, Kajoma.
pinakamainit na pagbati po sa inyong lahat <clears throat> mula sa kilusang magbubukid ng Pilipinas at maging mula sa anak pawis party list. Uh, una sa lahat, uh, tayo po ay nagpapasalamat kay Kajoma, siyempre kasama na kay Kajuli, sa napakalinaw, uh, sistematiko at komprehensibong uh, pagbabahagi sa atin ng nananatiling sa alit ng katangian ng moda ng produksyon sa Pilipinas, uh, malapyudal. Ang uh, malapyudalismo, uh, semi-pyudalism, uh, sa Pilipinas sa uh, gitna o sa harap ng mga kaganapang uh, pambansa at international at uh, masasabi nating uh, napakahalaga nito pong ating uh, uh, talakayan at pagbabahagi ng ito uh, na lupa ay uh, kinakailangan nating mas uh, uh, maipalaganap ang ating uh, saligang nananatiling pagsusuri na malapyudal pa rin ang ekonomiya ng uh, Pilipinas. At ito ay uh, pinangingibabawan ng mga lokal na nagaharing uring malalaking uh, burgas sa kumpador at paginong may lupa. At syempre sa kapakinabangan na rin ng malalaking burokrat at kapitalista at sa interes ng mga imperialistang bansa, pangunahin na ng imperialistang uh, Estados Unidos. Uh, matingkad doon sa pagbabahagi sa atin ni Kajoma ay uh, uh, pwede kong sabihin hindi lang uh, uh, panilin lang kundi pambabaluktot ng mga datos mismo ng gobyerno uh, at pag underestimate o understate ng uh, uh, populasyon ng mga pangunahing produktibong pwersa sa ating bansa, lalong-lalo na ang uh, nabibilang sa uring magkasaka. At, uh, at uh, pati na yung gross value of uh, agriculture natin at bahagi nito sa gross domestic product ay sadyang pinaliliit ang bahagi nito. At uh, kung saan ay nabanggit na nga na Sinasabing ang bahagi lang ng uh, sektor na agrikultura ay 7.4% sa GDP at ang bahagi niya sa kabuang uh, employment ng bansa ay 22.9%. Samantalang talagang uh, pinalobo naman ang uh, bahagi ng service sector sa bahagi nito sa GDP at bahagi nito sa uh, employment uh, sa ating bansa. Uh, totoo yung uh, binanggit ni Kajoma na Uh, pagdating sa kanayunan at produksyon ng sektor na ating agrikultura, lalo na pag tinuring nating isang buong industriya, sinama natin ng livestock, poultry, fisheries, uh, talagang sadyang pinaliliit ng uh, datos ng gobyerno, maging ng Department of Agriculture o ng, ng uh, Pilipinas Statistics uh, Authority. Uh, noong 2018, sinabi pa nga nila na ang bahagi lang ng uh, ng uh, gross value of agriculture natin ay nasa 1.8 trillion pesos. At uh, out of that uh, amount ay mga 1 trillion pesos lang ang contribution ng crop sector. Eh, uh, Simbawa, sa produksyon natin na lang ng palay, sinasabi 19 million metric tons ang ating uh, total palay output uh, ng 2019. Uh, saan ba binabati ang, binabase ang paghahalagan niyan? Doon sa farm grade price na nabili sa 10 piso, 12 pesos, 14 pesos ang uh, isang kilo ng palay o sa buying price ba ng National Food Authority na 19 pesos per kilo o sa retail price nito na naglalaro ng uh, karaniwan na 40 pesos o mahigit pa 42 pesos. O, pag binasi mo talaga sa farm grade price na napakabagsak ng presyo, pwedeng uh, yon mapapaliit mo yung halaga. Eh yung mga produkto na magkasakan dinadala sa mga maliliit na palengke, sa mga bayan, o kahit sa lungsod, uh, sa mga talipapa, uh, bukod pa sa nabanggit na nga na yung naiiwan sa kamay ng magkasaka at saka ba ng magkasaka na para sa kanilang pangkonsumo, o nahalagahan ba yon So hindi nahalagahan yon Kaya uh, masasabi nating at uh, kung sa magsasaka ay uh, 
sinasabi mismo ng Pilipinas sa Sisik Authority na may 9.7 million na mga magkasaka, maging isda, magagawang agrikultural. O eh ilan ang miyembro ng pamilya noon? Uh, ang sabihin na natin sa lima. Uh, oh, palagay ko yung tatlo dun sa miyembrong lima na yun ay, uh, ay nagka, may contribution sa produksyon, nagawaing pamproduksyon. So, ang uh, mga magninyog, sinasabi ng datos ng Philippine Coconut Authority at ng PCS, PSA mismo, 3.5 million ang ating mga uh, magninyog. Ang ating, sa magtataba ko lang natin, sinasabi 800,000 ang ating mga magtatanim ng tabako. O ay ang manggagawang bukid natin, manggagawang agrikultural, ang mga manging isda. So, talagang uh, dahil... Uh, Sinasad niya na paliitin uh, ito namang mga uh, iilang mga uh, puwersa na uh, nagdadala ng uh, kanilang uh, masasabi nating revisionist ng linya o subjectivist na linya na minimisrepresent nila ang ekonomiya ng Pilipinas bilang industrial kapitalista. So, isa yan lang sa aking uh, mababanggit na uh, pwede nating sabihin uh, yan, realidad yan sa ating uh, uh, malawak na kanayunan ng bansa. May mga lungsod tayo kahit sa mga probinsya na kalakan pa rin ang kanilang mga baryo ay nakabase sa ekonomi ang ekonomiya nila sa agrikultura o agriculture based o kaya naman agriculture related services ang kanilang mga Uh, service sector. Kaya, pag pumunta ka nga sa mga commercial centers, kung may mga shopping malls, uh, pag siguro inuri-uri na, kin, kin, uh, ano to, uh, inalam natin yung uring pinagmulan o kinabibilangan, palakhan nun sa uring magkasaka. So, uh, at may mga lungsod na, na wala pa rin talagang sektor ng manufaktura, manufacturing sector, o talaga industrial sector, mas commercial, uh, trading, uh, at karaniwan ay tinetrade, ginapalakal, ay mga produkto ng ating mga uh, magkasaka. So, yun yung isang uh, nais ko lang na ibahaging uh, uh, punto. At uh, talagang hindi nasa interes ng imperialismo, lalo na ng imperialist status Unidos, ngayon pumasok na itong interes ng imperialistang China, Uh, at ng mga lokal na naghaharing uri na sadyang panatilihing malapyudal ang ating ekonomiya, atrasado, agrario, pre-industrial uh, uh, at uh, talagang walang mga saligang industriya, uh, walang industrial base, walang uh, base o pundasyon ang ating uh, industrial, ang ating uh, ekonomiya. Katunayan uh, sa datos mismo ng gobyerno, ng Department of Finance uh, eh, uh, uh, may isang na pong libong mga small and medium enterprises at itong mga SMCs na ito, sila pa yung nagbabayad ng regular na 30% noong uh, kanilang uh, net uh, taxable income. Samantalang yung mga 3,150 firms, ito yung malalaki uh, yung binanggit na ni Kajofana Uh, silang nangunguna, no? uh, mga kumpador uh, burgesya, uh, kumpador uh, Panginoong May Lupa sa ating bansa, eh, uh, sila pa ang nakikinabang sa tax incentives at uh, tax exemptions. Kariniwang binabayaran lang nila, naglalaro sa 6% to 13% ng effective tax. Kaya nga, noong taong 2014, ayon din sa 20, uh, 2017, Ayon sa datos mismo ng Department of Finance, ang foreign revenues dun sa mga kabuang ipinagkaloob na tax exemptions, tax incentives sa 3,150 firms ay umaabot ng 441 billion pesos. O, eh pag dinagdag pa yung sinasabing mga 63 billion pesos sa posibilidad na pag-abuso dun sa transfer pricing, eh sinasabing aabot pa sa 540 pesos. O sabi din ng datos ng uh, uh, Department of Finance from 2015 to 2017, mga more than 1.1 trillion pesos ang foreign revenues dahil doon sa mga tax exemptions, tax incentives. Eh dagdag mo yung dalawang taon pa na 2018-2019, sabihin natin 5400 billion yun. 
Adi ibig sabihin ang foreign revenues maglalaro ng 2 trillion pesos sa nalolooban ng limang taon. Aba eh hindi na pala tayo dapat nangungutang. Hindi na pala dapat, hindi naman pala tayo nangungutang. Si Duterte at mga nagahari uri. At kung sino nasa puder, sila nangungutang sa ngalan ng ngalandoro sa bayan ng Pilipino. So dalawang da, 2 trillion pesos malinaw kung hindi binibigyan ng mga katakam-takam na mga tax exemptions, tax incentives, yung malalaking mga impresa o uh, merong mga 549 ecozones sa ating bansa ayon sa datos ng DTI, ng Department of Finance at kalakhan niyan ay nasa loob ng PESA, no? 531 ang pagkakaalam ko. Ay lahat 'yan yung sinasabing mga uh, uh, foreign monopoly firms na tumit ano uh, tatamasan ng mga tax incentives tax uh, uh, exemptions nandiyan nandiyan sila so uh, so kaya dahil walang industrial base at ekonomiya so uh, at talagang uh, underdeveloped at uh, kahit sinasabi ng gobyerno na ay uh, ang ating bansa na nanatiling agricultural ang ating bansa pero pinaliliit naman nila ang bahagi ng agrikultura sa buong uh, halagang na nalilikha. So yun yung ikalawa. Uh, uh, ang isa pa pong mahalagang mabanggit, siyempre, reforma sa lupa ay talaga pong uh, uh, wala pa rin ang uh, tunay na reforma sa lupa, lupa at uh, tunay na programa sa pambansang industrialisasyon sa sa ating bansa at katunayan may mga panukalang uh, batas pa nga sa 18 Congress na uh, hindi para uh, madaliin ang pagpapasa o pagpapatibay ng genuine nagrara reform bill na matagal na nating iniyahain na maiisa batas o hindi pa po magpapalala doon sa uh, fundamental uh, problem of landlessness sa ating mga Filipino peasants lalo na itong panukalang national uh, proposed national use national land use uh, act at uh, ang konsentrasyon ngayon ng Department of Agriculture sa bagong pamunuan nito ay mamahagi ng mga public uh, lands meron daw mga 217,000 na uh, hectares ang target nila eh yung isang undersecretary ng DAR ay nagrereklamo na rin dahil uh, hindi raw tumutugon yung ibang mga ahensya ng gobyerno na itan over sa dar yung kanilang mga lupang nasa possession nila na public agricultural lands para may pamahagi sa mga prospective agrarian reform beneficiaries so uh, yun ang alamang public agricultural lands na nga lang ay uh, ay uh, hindi pa malinaw na hindi maipapatupad ng gobyerno at may plano po sila may project sila na split yung mga collective certificates of land ownership award ay titipak-tipakin uh, uh, gagawing individual uh, title uh, ba sa halip na papagkaisahin po yung mga magkasaka natin so yung parcelization ng uh, uh, mga titulo na yan collective title ay uh, hindi ito magpapalakas sa uh, pagkakaisa ng hanay ng mga magkasaka ang gusto lang talaga niyan ay gawing uh, yung po bang uh, maging negotiable instruments at uh, yung marketability ng uh, lupa bilang tinuturing na commodity sa land market at uh, para madaling ma-dispose, uh, di bibilis naman nyo. O di man po rekonsentrasyon sa kamay ng mga dating Panginoong May Lupa, yung mga bagong tipong uh, tinatawag nating bagong tipong Panginoong uh, May Lupa. So hindi malulutas yung land problem kundi mas uh, lalala pa. Uh, kaya ang KMP po nananatiling pinapanghawakan at less than 7 out of 10 uh, Filipino peasants do not own the land they till. Nananatili pa po yun. At uh, pag isinama pa natin yung kahit na yung mga naging beneficiaryo ng pakitang taong land reform program ng GRP ay uh, more than 75% ay hindi nakakahulog ng um, sa lupa, pati na na-interest dahil hindi naman dapat, dapat nga libre pong mahagi ng lupa bilang basic uh, principle and central goal ng isang genuine agrarian reform program uh, ay uh, pinatawa ng mabigat na uh, mabigat na obligasyon sa balikat po nila. E pag dinagdag natin yung mga uh, more than 75% na 100,000 mga agrarian reform beneficiaries 
na sinasabing dapat magulog na ng kanilang amortisasyon, aba ay eh, lalong lalaki yung hindi na pa rin nila ganap na pag-aari yung lupang sinasaka. Ang ibig po bang sabihin kung dati sila ay uh, nagbabayad ng buwis o upa sa lupa, ay humalili lang yung gobyerno na sinisingil pinipigaan sila ng mataas na amortisasyon sa lupa kasama na yung mataas na interest, 6% interest per annum. So ganun lang, kumalit lang yung gobyerno mismo doon sa katayo anong mga uh, ilang mga Panginoong may lupa na sinaklaw ng pakitang taong lente kong problem ng gobyerno at uh, kung kaya't uh, sabi natin, binibigyan diin po natin na uh, Uh, nananatiling fundamental na problema ang kawanan ng lupa o kakulangan ng lupa ng kalakhang mayorya pa rin ng ating mga nabibilang sa uri ng magsasaka na pangunahing produktibong pwersa sa panayunan. Kung kaya't uh, may kakagyatan at uh, yan po ang kahalagahan kung bakit mahalaga ang tunay na reforma sa lupa at uh, pambansang industrialisasyon mga programa ito bilang pangunahing reksitos sa tunay na pag-ulad ng ekonomiya ng ating bansa. Siyempre, uh, kasama na po dyan yung ating pagigit at uh, ikipaglaban at talagang matamasa ng bansa ang kanyang sariling economic self-reliance, economic independence, sovereignty uh, para uh, mapaunlad ang ating uh, pambansa ekonomiya. So pinalalapit itong land problem, yung underdevelopment ng ating sektor ng agrikultura bilang industriya uh, ng neoliberal na patakara ng imperialistang globalisasyon. So hindi na po ako magpapalawig dyan uh, at malalim na po at systematic na po ang uh, pagbabahagi sa atin ni Kajoma. Uh, ang masasabi lang natin mula nang ipinasok po ang Pilipinas bilang miyembro ng World Trade Organization noong January of 1995 after na i-ratify ng Philippine Senate yung Uruguay Round na Final Act noong December 14, 1994, siyempre yung pagtutulak na niya ng uh, uh, trade and investment liberalization, lalo na particular yung agreement on agriculture sa ilalim ng uh, uh, Uruguay Round, uh, ng uh, kasunduan na yan. Uh, ang panimula ko pong pagtu pagtuos, computasyon, hindi po trade ta surplus ang uh, tinamasa ng ating uh, bansa. Lalo na doon sa agricultural trade balance po natin. Uh, sapagkat pag pinagsama-sama po natin, cumulative, uh, cumulatively, from 1995 hanggang pwede po pong sabihin end of 2018, hindi po bababa sa 50 billion dollars eh. Yung ating kabuang uh, uh, naging tra agricultural trade deficit ng ating bansa, hindi po trade surplus. Nung kasi nangangako sila na ay pag niratipay natin itong Uruguay Round na ito, Final Act, yan agreements on tariff and trade, ay uh, madadagdagan ang gross value ng ating agriculture production, madadagdagan ang limandaang libong mga uh, trabaho sa kanayunan, lalaki yung ating tra agriculture trade surplus, ay hindi po nangyari yon at talaga pong kabaligtaran ang uh, ang Pilipinas dyan sa mga di pantay na kasunduan na yan o tratado, uh, pangkalakalan o pang-ekonomiya uh, matagal na pong pinapanawagan kasama ang KMP noon po nagbuo pa tayo ng pumala pang sa unay ng mamayang laban sa sagat o liberal sesyo sa agrikultura at nananawagan tayong uh, uh, junk WTO junk uh, APEC resist imperialist globalization at siyempre, uh, uh, bumaklas ang Pilipinas dyan sa World Trade uh, Organization na yan. Pati na po dyan sa uh, yung mga uh, policy-based na loans ng ADB. Uh, kung hindi po malakas yung kampanya ng mga magkasaka, kasama ng mga manggagawat kawani ng National Food Authority, eh, mat ma malapalagay ko po na ipatupad nila yung Green Sector Development Program na Uh, mula sa pautang ng Asian Development Bank. Pero ang mga kondisyon po nun, ah, patungo sa privatisasyon ng National Food Authority, i-liberalize yung uh, uh, rice trade natin, trading, uh, payagan ang mga pribadong sektor na mag-angkat ng bigas. Uh, ayan, uh, 
At uh, gusto nila i-deregulate yung function ng NFA, uh, lalo na sa pamimili ng palay, i-decouple uh, i yung functions niya. At uh, ayan po, alos natupad na doon sa rice trade liberalization law, yung rice retail uh, uh, RTL, uh, sinatarification law. Uh, na pinirimahan ni President Dito, Digong Duterte. February 14 yata yun, 2019. Na talaga po ngayon, nararamdaman lalo muli na magkasaka, mababang presyo ng palay dahil bumabaha ang imports natin na uh, bigas. Uh, hindi pa natin sinasama yung smuggling ng uh, bigas sa ating bansa. Hindi naman bumaba yung presyo ng bigas sa uh, lokal na pamilihan. Ano pong solusyon para sa isang stab, uh, is, uh, stable at uh, sustainable food security sa bawat maawang Pilipino, abay patupad ang tunay na reforma sa lupa at pambansa industrialisasyon at palakasin ng lokal na produksyon natin ng uh, palay at food crops production sa ating bansa to really attain our self-sufficiency and genuine food security para sa mamamayang uh, Pilipino. Panghuli po, uh, nananatili pong mahigpit na at nalakas na sinusuportahan ng KMP ng Pawis. Uh, uh, Siyempre, uh, kung hindi man sa ilalim ni Rehimeng US Duterte ngayon ang pagpapatuloy ng peace negotiation uh, ay sa mga susunod na administrasyon kung merong eleksyon sa 2022 uh, dahil naniniwala po ang KMP ng Pawis na Uh, mahalaga ang uh, pag-resolba uh, uh, sa root causes ng unconflict sa ating bansa, lalo na yung uh, uh, pangangailangan, uh, ang pangangailangan at kakagetan sa pagpapatupad ng uh, agrara reform, rural development, national industrialization, economic development, mahal po yung dalawang paksa sa uh, uh, comprehensive agreement uh, on social and economic reforms para magkaroon po talaga ng fundamental na reform ang punan pang ekonomiya hanggang sa reform ang pang politika po uh, sa ating bansa. Siyempre po, uh, kinakailangan lalong palakasin at pasulungin pa ang anti-feudal, uh, anti-pasista, anti-imperialista ng para katulusan sa buong mundo. So, uh, para nang sa panumalaya at uh, nakapagsasarili at uh, tinasama sa ang uh, tunay na kaunlaran ng bawat maumayang uh, Pilipino. At uh, makamit po ang tunay, uh, matagalang uh, Uh, kapayapaan sa ating uh, bansa. Uh, maraming salamat po uh, kapaeng sa inyong um, reaction sa uh, talk uh, ni, ni Ka Joma and um, ulit no, maraming salamat kay, uh, kay Ka Joma sa pagbahagi ng isang napaka komprehensibo no at uh, napakalinaw na paglalahad no sa mga pangyayari no at uh, mga pag pag pagunlad no ng uh, itong malapyudal na moda ng produksyon no sa sa Pilipinas itong huling uh, tatlong dekada no sa sa puntong ito um yung um uh, pwede na nating ano no uh, i-open ang uh, ang body para sa mga uh, katanungan at uh, kung may mga dagdag ng mga komento ang uh, ating mga kasama na uh, nandito ngayon no sa sa ating um, capsule critics na, na webinar uh, mangyaring uh, ano pwede niyo i-chat po uh, sa sa ating chat box no kung ang inyong mga mga questions o kaya uh, ano po no uh, pwede niyo ding ibahagi ito no uh, i-unmute po yung inyong microphone teka hintay tayo kung may mga ano Um, yung sa sa time natin naman ay supposedly ay magdara ng two hours itong event at um, uh, hanggang six no but uh, sa tingin ko naman no dahil napakamahalaga no ng uh, ng pagtatagpong ito ay uh, maari naman tayong mag-extend no ng konti to, to accommodate no uh, yung discourse no yung talastasan at mga mga tanong at mga diskusyon uh. Meron po bang mga ano? Sino ba yung mauna na uh, pagi sa chat ng private? Tek. Tek. 
ka may 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 natanggap po ako dito sa ano sa private na ano yan uh, private chat no um tagap kaming tanong dito no um yung nabanggit dito ita-type ko ikaka-copy paste ko yung tanong tapos i ilalagay ko sa chat box uh, sabi dito no um may natanggap kami uh, ano yan no uh, may tanggap pa kaming tanong sa ng chat no um naging tampok ang new liberal uh, policy no sa discussion ng pag sa pagpasok ng uh, dekada 1980 um, paano po unawain ang new liberal policy no um, ito it, uh, para ano uh, clarification ata to no kung uh, ano yung tinutukoy ito ito po naging tampok ang new liberal policy no sa sa discussion sa pagpasok ng dekada 80 no paano po daw unawain yung uh, uh, new liberal uh, policy no siguro ano yan no kung ano din yung yun na yung entire discussion din kanina eh no kung ano yung uh, naging impact ng uh, new liberal policy sa pag uh, pagpapatindi ng malapyudalismo so baka baka ano lang clarification lang sir to kung ano ba talaga yung new liberal policy or yung new liberalismo. Sige po. Ano? Paano unawain ang new liberal policy? Ayun na. Paano unawain ang new liberal policy ng pumasok ng dekada 80? Ah. Um, yung kuwaning uh, sa panghalata ng ibig sabihin ng neoliberalismo hindi man ano yan eh hindi man kasunod yan ng classical na liberalismo uh, kundi yung ano yung uh, ang pinaka basic line niyan yung palakihin mo yung kapital na nasa kamay ng mga kapitalista at uh, doon makakalikha daw ng maraming trabaho uh, at makapag uh, uh, palaki ng ekonomiya. So, ang um, ang uh, ilang uh, basic points sa neoliberalismo para mapalaki yung kapital sa kamay ng mga kapitalista, yung ano, uh, ibagsak mo yung ano, yung kita ng mga manggagawa. Ibig sabihin, patay mo yung tinawag na surplus value o profits na mapupunta uh, sa uh, mga kapitalista. Pagkatapos, cut back sa social, uh, social benefits ng mga manggagawa, mga uh, social services, ibabagsak mo rin. Pagkatapos, i-privatize mo pa yung profitable uh, public assets. No? Kaya tubig at kung elektrisidad at ano pang dating tinatanganan ng gobyerno uh, i-privatize. Pagkatapos, i-liberalize yung investment and trade policy. Pagkatapos, uh, bahagi ng mga bansang dominado ng mga imperialista, yung ano, i-denationalize yung economy nila. Itiwangwang yung economy nila. I-surrender nila yung national patrimony, etc. Et uh, ibig sabihin ay kuha ng sa pinakamataas ang task ay yun, palakihin mo yung kapital na nasa kamay ng mga uh, monopolyo, uh, mga monopolyo kapitalista sa, uh, ano, sa mga bansang imperialista. Ngayon, pagdating sa Pilipinas, paano nangyari? Uh, kasi ganito yun eh, uh, um, ang neoliberalismo inadapt dahil nagkaroon na ng ano, crisis of overproduction. Noong uh, 1970s, na, uh, lubusang uh, uh, nakapag-reconstruct na ang mga, nasa, mga natalong imperialistang bansa sa World War II. Uh, mga tulad ng Germany, Japan, Italy at iba pa, no? nakapag-reconstruct. At uh, yung uh, eh, mga ekonomiyang yan ng mga natalong imperialista, sa pilitan nga niyan ay eh, binuhay muli yan dahil sa ano yung takot ng uh, US imperialism na ano susulungan ng uh, halimbawa dito sa Europe susulungan ng uh, sosyalismo yung natakot sila sa Union Soviet kaya nagka-iron curtain na ginawa mga imperialista at uh, ano yan sa kalaunan naman yung uh, uh, 
Uh, Amerika na numero uno sa produksyon, sa militar at uh, civil na produksyon, dahil ano yan, ah, hindi, hindi, kwan yun eh, walang tradisyon na nakuha sa World War II. Ang parang uh, uh, protected by the Pacific and Atlantic, no? oceans yan, uh, hindi nasalakay, kundi liban na doon sa Pearl Harbor na panandalian. Kaya yung uh, supremacy ng US sa production, ano na yon na uh, ano yon uh, challenge at inuukok na ng mga ng uh, production. Kaya may problema ng uh, nalinulutas ng uh, uh, US imperialism yung tinawag na stagflation ng 1970s. Ano mang gawin to expand the economy, uh, halimbawa, Bululuwagan nila yung daloy ng pera uh, pero hindi naman ano, lumalago yung uh, ekonomiya o kaya eh, higpitan nila uh, para ano yung uh, inflation bumagsak higpitan nila yung pera yung interest rate kaya naisipan nila neoliberalism at ito ay ka, kaugnay ito ng ano eh yung uh, uh, kapasyahan ng mga imperialist ng bansa na ipasa sa third world yung crisis ng overproduction sa mga imperialistang bansa, ipasa nila sa third world. Ngayon, nagkataon din na may ano, yung para i-expand yung economy ng mga imperialistang bansa, uh, naisipan din nila na yung mag-adapt ng higher technology at uh, yung mga dating teknolohiya na para sa militar lamang, yung mga electronic products na nakikita natin. Mga 1950s to onwards, ano na yan eh, mga technology na yan eh, uh, ano yun, nasa militar na, pero for security reasons. Pero sa panahon ng 19, umabot eh, 1990s, nagpaluwag na sila, uh, kinomersyalize itong mga cellphone at kung ano-ano pa. So ano, ang sa bandang Pilipinas, uh, halimbawa, para may ilusyon Uh, on the consumption side, pinalaki yung daloy ng pera. Um, isang aspeto ng neoliberalismo yung kwan, pagluluwag sa neoliberal credit. Pero ang pinuntahan ng malaking kapital sa private construction at sa circulation ng mga electronic products para kasi na overproduce yung uh, mga construction equipment at uh, construction materials at yung electronic products dumami uh, kaya uh, yung ano sa uh, consumption side yung yung financing ginamit para uh, dumalo yung mga produkto na yan mula sa labas at pagdating sa production side ano nanatili ang kwan Pilipinas na ano agrarian pa rin sa katotohanan yan pa rin ang mainstay ng economy uh, yung yan ang uh, nag-assure ng ano, ng uh, most of the uh, food needs of the country. Uh, pagkatapos mayroon pang export crops na galing sa agriculture. Uh, pero hindi sapat yan. Pagkatapos, uh, yung bagong ipinasok si Lalo Neoliberalism, yung reassembly. Uh, pina, dahil mura yung uh, uh, halaga ng paggawa sa uh, Pilipinas, So, ano yan, 19, uh, late 1970s, yun yan, uh, tuloy-tuloy. So, on the production side, walang ibinago na natili yung, ano, yung agrarian foundation rather than industrial ano, uh, foundation. At uh, yung ilang mga uh, burgis na ekonomista, yung mga burgis na ekonomista, kala nila, ano yun, uh, movement towards... Uh, 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 being a newly industrialized country. Pero ano yun? Yung hindi naitatayo, walang uh, hindi naitatayo yung ano, yung industrial foundation, hindi nakakagawa ng uh, productive equipment la inaangkat yan, mga electromechanical equipment. At ngayon, pinapasukan pa ng pang-speed up na digital equipment. Pero ano yan? Gawa sa labas yan. So at uh, ang pambayad diyan ay ano yung uh, uh, kita sa export crop yung main day pagkatapos yung mining na malaki rin daya diyan yung uh, 
ini smuggle lang siya yung or orang ili nalabas um, pagkatapos maliit ang kita sa reassembly kasi yung components diyan tapos na yan eh bali pinagtatagpi-tagpi na lang sa sa Pilipinas at matapos ng 1997 crisis ano yung bumagsak yan uh, so uh, ang malaking bagay na dinevelop ng ano na, na ang bagong bagay na malakihan na pinanggalingan ng pera uh, uh, na foreign exchange ay yung overseas contract workers lumaki yan. Uh, umpisa niyan yung petrodollars, yung mga deposit ng mga oil producing countries sa uh, west. Uh, si, ano yun, recycle yan for construction din sa Middle East. Kaya nag-umpis yan. Pagkatapos eh, nakita nila na ano, yung... Uh, kapalit ng neo ng kolonyalismo mabuti pa yung cheap labor papuntahin mo na sa mga bansang kapitalista kaya lumaki yan pagkatapos yung mga uh, ano yon yung mga uh, ilang uh, um, ano to industriya tulad ng ano uh, yung business processing ano rin yan primero linipat yan sa Uh, India ng malakihan mula sa Western countries tapos eh, uh, mamaya nalipat sa Pilipinas. Kaya yan ang sources ng foreign exchange. Sa madaling salita, uh, sa lahat ng mga uh, pinagkakita ng foreign exchange Pilipinas, hindi sumasapat para sagutin yung mas malaking gastos uh, sa mga material na ipinapasok sa Pilipinas, mga commodity na ipinapasok sa Pilipinas na, ano, na uh, in the form of equipment, in the form of consumer ano, cons uh, consumer products. So, ganyan kalagayan ng Pilipinas, uh, laging uh, nasa deficit. At sa... Um, ito ang Pilipinas na laging linalampas. Ang ganito yan eh. Uh, yung mga, may mga analyst na kasabi, oh, ang Pilipinas hindi makalarga sa in, uh, land reform at industrialization dahil tangan ng mga landlords sa... Uh, uh, yung lower house laging ano yan yan ang bumabara sa ano uh, anumang policy of land reform and industrialization uh, yung uh, uh, laging uh, pero ang dahilan yan uh, nabibiktima yung ang Pilipinas dahil sa kayamanan yan sa uh, uh, sa malaking kayamanan yan sa uh, natural resources gusto na ng US at iba pa ang, pati Hapon na ang Pilipinas manatiling source of cheap ano, uh, raw materials kaya hindi isinama yan sa anti-communist uh, campaign to build industries to industrialize Korea uh, North uh, South Korea, Taiwan and uh, some Southeast Asian countries um, yung ano uh, ang Pilipinas at Indonesia sinasadyang ano uh, hindi industrialized para manatiling ano rich source of uh, raw materials. Iyan ang assignment na ibinibigay ng ano imperialista sa dalawang bansang ito. Uh, so they are victimized by their own natural blessings of ano rich uh, uh, natural resources. Um, kaya ano yan hindi um, hindi ano hindi in the um, uh, pinipigilan ng pagiging uh, newly industrialized laging binabanggit natin yung pag-aasawahan ng ano uh, land reform at uh, uh, national industrialization ano yan sa pilitang mag-asawa yan kung, kung gusto mo umuunlad sa Pilipinas kasi ano eh mag, meron magkaroon ka man ng ano the best kind of land reform kung walang national industrialization ano yan mari ano yon yung Uh, mauwi pa rin yan sa land concentration kasi ano yan eh uh, walang outlet for the surplus capital from from agriculture at yung surplus population yung surplus labor walang pupuntahan uh, uh, ang outlet ng surplus kukomo sa agriculture sa agriculture naturally sa industrialization ang, at, ang outlet ng surplus population sa national industrialization kaya kailangan uh, magkasama lagi yan. Uh, walang land reform na magsasaksid. Pero uh, ang problema naman sa land reform program sa Pilipinas, 
antimano, bulok, bogus. Dahil laging may limitasyon, mayroong uh, ang daming limitasyon, daming loophole, ang maraming ano, madaling ikutan ng mga landlords. Uh, so, uh, ganyan. Uh, yung neoliberalism sumasakay sa mga lumang problema. Huh? Bagong, panibagong problema ang neoliberalization, yung pinaigting yung mga pamamaraan ng pagsasamantala. Kasi ano yan eh, rule of unbridled greed yan eh. Yung kwan, uh, uh, kaya nasabi ko, <laughs> yung neoliberalism labag pa sa ano eh, classical na, neo, uh, na liberalismo. Kaya kasi, kasi si Adam Smith, si Adam Smith kinikilala niya eh, na ang source of value ay yung paggawa. Huh? Uh, tulad ni, tulad ni, yan din eh, uh, sinunod ni Marx, no? at dinevelop na yung theory of surplus value. Pero itong neoliberalism, kikilala lang yung, ano, yung kapitalista, ginagawa pang parasitiko yung tunay na takapag, tagapag, tagagawa ng, ano, ng value, mga, ang mga uring manggagawa at iba pang uh, anak pawis. Uh, so, ganyan. Ang, ano, um, itong itong ano, neoliberalismo na eh, na uwi na sa sariling um, sa sariling ano na uwi na sa disaster dahil sa sa sariling ano ba ang na pagsaka sa yung neoliberalism kaya ano <laughs> uh, uh, hindi magkakasya kahit isang oras yan pero panagay ko na sabi ko na yung essential points kaya ma para mapun para kayo na kapag bigay ako ng ilang kaliwanagan uh, at pwedeng magpatuloy sa ibang tanong. Ano? Sige, ma maraming salamat no sa ano din no yung uh, um, yung yung pagsagot sa sa tanong ng ating kasama tungkol sa new liberal policy. May meron tayong apat na iba pang tanong. Uh, basahin ko isa-isa no yung una, yung pinakauna uh -huh. siguro. Uh, ito ang programa ng PPDR ay land reform at national industrialization. Pero hindi uunlad ng tuloy-tuloy ang bansa kung hindi tutuloy sa sosyalismo. Paano natin matitiyak na magtuloy-tuloy sa sosyalismo pagkatapos ng NDR? Sa ekonomiya, politika at kultura, ano ang mga tungkuli na dapat laging panghawakan? Mula kay J.T. Salcedo. Um, al alam ninyo, hindi ano, necessarily sosyalismo away. In theoretical terms, ha? and based on previous practical experience. Yung kapitalismo, uh, nagde-develop yan bunga ng surplus created by agriculture. Tingnan nyo yung history ng England huh? at Pransya, mga naunang industrial countries. At Amerika lalo na, yung, ano, yung, uh, uh, yung surplus ng agriculture, yun ang... Uh, ano ito? Yun, yun ang batayan ng industrial development. Uh, yun ang pinanggagaling. Pati kalakalar, yung differentiation of town and countryside. Pag, pag may agricultural surprise, kapag tayo ng mga bayanan, nagtatayo ng uh, handicrafts industry, hanggang uh, magpunta sa pre-industrial manufacturing, hanggang uh, uh, ano na, yung uh, industrial manufacturing na sa industrial revolution. Ngayon, um, yung, alam ba ninyo ang South Korea, limbawa, agricultural part of Korea yan. So, ibig sabihin, um, for industrialization to occur, you have to do land reform. And then, it, uh, yung combination of land reform does, and uh, industrialization does not necessarily lead to socialism. <laughs> Ginawa ng South Korea na ano eh, na ano ba, example ng US para ipakita na ano, You don't have to adapt socialism uh, to an uh, industrialize. Uh, kaya, uh, bagamat ano, pasista si ano, uh, Pak, ano, si Pak Chung He, uh, ano yun, yung nagawa niyang kapitalista, industrial capitalist, dahil um, uh, sa paningin ng US, importante ano, may frontline na example laban sa industrialist socialist industrialization ng Korea. Uh, pero, como revolutionaryo, siyempre, kwan, at nakikita ko naman yung 
kagunggungan ng mga burgess na leader sa Pilipinas ay mas gusto nila yung maging ano at the best at the most ay comparador kapitalista ay ayaw nilang maging industrial capitalist eh talaga ano pagkakataon yan ng ng mga revolusyonaryo na itulak ang ano sosyalismo na magiging bunga ng pambansang demokratikong kilusan uh, kung yung nagahari sistema na dominado ng malaking komprador at mga sentero nabubulok ng nabubulok at nagbunga na ng armadong revolusyon aba eh di mabuti para sa mga taong gustong ano magkaroon ng sosyalismo ito na nga ang paraan para magkaroon ng sosyalismo imbis na no dadaan pa sa pagiging kapitalista so pero theoretically kung maalis to <laughs> at uh, may may may, may Uh, kahiyan sa sarili mga nag, namumunong uh, uh, namumunong sa nagharing sistema pwede nilang ipilit eh sa mga amo nilang imperialista tingnan natin kung hanggang hanggang saan ang kaya nila sa pagpupumilit na industri- industrialize ang Pilipinas pero ganun man given na yan uh, nagtagal na eh na ano nananatiling malapit na lang Pilipinas at uh, walang ginawa para ano ma-industrialize ang Pilipinas mabuti pa na pagkakataon na ito para uh, ang mga manggagawa at magsaka magtaysa para uh, palitan ang nag-aaring sistema at uh, sa pagpapalit ng kapangkarihan pampolitika doon magkakaroon ng political will eh, para magtayo ng sosyalismo uh, at ito naman ang kakibat nito ang ano, reforma sa lupa uh, cooperativization and uh, mechanization of agriculture Uh, related to um, uh, industrialization in the socialist future. Um, Siyempre, ang pinag-usapan pa ngayon ay eh, sagutin yung land hunger ng mga magsasaka. Eh, dapat ipamudmud yung lupa uh, na konsentrado sa kamay ng mga ilang panginong may lupa at ilang asyendero. At uh, mabuti naman na ano, uh, itong mga Uh, politiko sa nagaring sistema limitado ang ihi- imaginasyon, political will at uh, nagpapakasapat sila sa pagiging mga tuta sa mga uh, sa foreign monopoly capitalism at uh, nasa nahihirati sila sa mga lumang pamamaraan sa pagsasamantala. So ganoon. Uh, ang ano naman eh tulad sa Russia, sa China yung kapag yung mga nagaharang uri nagiging stupido uh, ma- magiging uh, masadong sakim at uh, at uh, malupit uh, yung pinagpapatuloy nila yung mga lumang pamamaraan pagkakataon yan ng mga revolusyonaryo na kumilos na at uh, ang mga nagsasama- pinagsasamantalang uri makalaya sa mga nagsasamantalang uri Sige, mara- maraming salamat ka Jomas sa paglinaw sa tanong ni uh, kasama ang ano Joselito Salcedo. Ah uh, itong may isa pang tanong dito. Um, sabi dito ay hinggil po sa paglaki ng service uh, sector, may pagbabago ba ito sa bilang o percentage ng mga uri sa Pinas? Kung mayroon anong implikasyon nito? Yung ano yung konsekwensya ng um, uh, ng paglobo ng service sector ano yun uh, ang service sector hindi nakakapag-employ ang ng marami ang daya ng mga statisticians eh, ipinapasok nila sa ipinapasok nila sa service sector na yung uh, in terms of employment yung mga ad jobbers at pagkatapos eh, ang ganito yan eh uh, una sa lahat piliwanag natin kung paano lumulubo yan um, uh, consumption oriented yung ano daloy ng pera at uh, foreign at ano ex, uh, at uh, import dependent yung mga uh, main consumer products na pinapasok uh, yung uh, ganito ang uh, lumaki diyan uh, trading uh, uh, finance and trading no uh, but uh, related to what real things no uh, 
yung ano, ang real diyan yung so private construction at yung pagpapalaganap ng mga new, mga electronic products. Yun ang mga outstanding uh, uh, things na pinagkakastutan. At siyempre yung uh, uh, yung uh, pag-ikot ng pera, uh, yung yung mga nakakalamang sa kita, uh, ano yun, mga bumibili ng mga kotse. Kaya dumadami ng mga pribadong sasakyan. Yun ang nag-generate, hindi yung kwan. Uh, productive equipment ay yung hindi ang nade-develop hindi nade-develop yung abilidad mismo ng Philippine economy na mag-produce ng uh, industrial equipment laging nag-import yan eh, natatawa nga ako sa isa lang isa lang gano eh, kaibigan kong aliman na no sasabi oh in uh, uh, yung medyo daw uh, capitalist industrialization is really going international kasi nag Dumalaw sa pabrika ng Magnolia. Eh, nakita nila mga equipment eh. Uh, uh, equipment eh, moderno. Tsaka napaka-efficient paggawa ng ano, ice cream. Eh? Pero sabi ko, hindi nyo tinignan kung saan made yan. Yung equipment na yan. Baka made in, uh, made in Germany yan o made in the US. Kasi ano yan eh. Yung equipment ng Magnolia, eh, kwan, eh. Uh, talo pa siguro yung hometown ice cream factory nung makaibigan kong uh, aliman. No? So ganyan, yung uh, some equipment come but only to produce you know, consumer goods and non-renewable bang equipment yan. Uh, pag nag-depreciate na, bibili ka uli ng ganong equipment. Ang nagagawa lang sa Pilipinas, yung repairs, uh, yung, kaya yung uh, reconditioning, Uh, assembly, etc. So, ganito, hindi hindi nababago yung kwan. Walang masyadong pagbabago sa ano, sa in terms of employment. Ganito ang daya sa kwan eh. Sa, mula pa sa panahon ni Blas Ople, linuloko na niya yung kwan eh, datos tungkol sa magsasaka. Sa PSR, sabi ko 75% ang magsasaka. Kasali na niya, kasali na dyan yung kwan. Uh, for Uh, and middle person na kakarami plus yung ano yung rich persons um, ngayon uh, ang ginawa basta kinategorize ang tao na farm worker ay ah, hindi na magsasaka yan pero yung dalawang klase ng farm worker sa Pilipinas 90% are what i call the traditional farm workers as old as the bible no panahon pa ng ano, slavery meron ng farm workers yung ano yung yung extra yung surplus la labor sa countryside makikitrabaho ha at mga siguro um, to be generous mga 10% yung ano yung modern farm workers na na nag-ooperate ng modern equipment yung nag-ooperate ng tractor yung harvester etc yung ano eh sa mga asyenda tuwing ano eh the, tuwing panahon ng pagtatabas yung mismo mga tabasero mga worker na tabasero sila pang may dala ng mga hand tools nila yung uh, panta, uh, pang ano uh, yung mga itak nila so ganun uh, mga fa, sa katotohanan magsasaka pa yan na ano na trying to augment their ano peasant income So so pagkatapos mayroon pang ano daya ng mga statisticians they call yung kwan ang kinikilala lang na na ano farmer o peasant sa pamilya yung head of the family uh, yung uh, um, yung uh, unpaid and may term ang ginagamit unpaid unpaid family work ha huh? Kasi sa mga pamilyang magsasaka eh, uh, liban na lang sa toddler yung tawag ko. Uh, basta 8 uh, years old ka, nakikitulong ka na sa farm work. Eh. So, pero tawag dyan, unpaid uh, family work. So pagkatapos, ilalabas nila yan sa figure ng korpesan. Pagdating naman sa output value ng agriculture, ganito, no, pinap ganito na papalaib. <laughs> ang ang landlord uh, at saka uh, lalo na yung 
tenants, hindi naman nagre-report ng value ng products nila. Ang nakikinigilala lang ng mga statisticians kung anong dumating sa uh, ano yan, uh, sa malaking palengke o sa malaking supermarket. no? Pero yung bentahan ng mga produkto sa uh, sa saklaw ng isang baryo o sa magkarating na baryo, hindi na kwentado yan. At siyempre, hindi na kukwenta yung malaking konsumo uh, ng mga magsasaka sa kanilang ano, sariling produkto. So, ganun. Doon na under value, eh, ang, sa ngayon, nagpipilit uh, nagpipilit yung mga ilang uh, ilang uh, uh, economist ng World Bank na ano, yung newly industrialized na o kung minsan kung medyo sila ah, okay, isa pang alternative ng tawag emerging market mga mga Pilipino na economist eh, kahit burgess eh, kung minsan ano, hesitant sila magtawag sa Pilipinas sa newly industrializing but, but the point is ano, they're trying to make it appear na ano, the peasants are disappearing and the land problem is that disappearing but actually Oftentimes, they cannot deny. They say uh, uh, the country is still uh, agriculture-based. No? Kasi in real productive terms, yan ang main source. No? Yan ang main source of value. Yung, uh, kasi yung industry, sa katotohanan, hindi, ano, doesn't produce uh, as much value because hanggang ano yan, primary, uh, primary production sa mining at saka sa manufacturing eh kun yun gumagamit lang ng mga imported components liban sa ilang uh, ilang industriya na gumagamit ng lo uh, uh, local raw materials so uh, ganun yung uh, yung service sector um, yung for ang formally employed yan maliit yan at saka kung uh, busisihin mo kasi uh, sa pagdami ng mga uh, restaurant uh, at, at sa mga part-time job sa mga ganyang tipo ng trabaho, eh, ano, eh pwede mong sitahin eh. Ano bang, ano bang klaseng ano yan, trabaho? Ang pinaka... Uh, sa, uh, yan na bahagi ay maliit. Uh, compared to yung ad jobbers, um, if you know barrio life uh, yung surplus uh, labor does not spill over into uh, ad jobs uh, uh, not only to the city but sa country side in both ways both ways um yung uh, sa pagkaalam ko yung ad jobber sa Manila ang ganun eh. pagbebenta ng tubig sa kapwa mahirap sa mga slum areas o yung paghahakot ng dumi uh, at basura. Yung may ikwan eh, yung mga maliliit, maliliit na informal jobs na, yan ang marami. At hindi nakukwenta ng mga ano, government statisticians uh, because ano, yung, it's really difficult to, ano, to, uh, to take into account all these kinds of ad jobs. Uh, but uh, uh, ah, pero ang ginagawa nila nag-estimate kung mga statisticians at tapos yung uh, uh, hindi nila matawag na agricultural tilling the field eh, ilinalagay na nila sa ano sa service sector uh, uh, so yung tagahakot ng tae sa mga ano uh, ilang areas ano yan uh, nasa service sector yan pero loko yung kwan at na uh, in at certainly in terms of value uh, talaga nga no run away yung service sector kasi yung dagsa ng pera para sa private construction and ano uh, 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 circulation of uh, electronic products na and ano uh, uh, upper uh, upper middle class uh, at least upper middle class uh, Uh, durable consumer products na tulad ng mga kotse at iba pa, eh talagang uh, ano, uh, malaki yan. Pero sa employment, maliit yan. Kahit, yung, pan, eh, kahit ibilang mo yung, ano, yung BPO na pinalalaki, 
Malit yan compared to the total population um, and to the total, uh, total labor force rather uh, in yung pang napakaliit na proportion. Maraming salamat po sa ano? paglilinaw dito sa usapin ng uh, yung sect, uh, uh, service sector. Uh, yung isang tanong pa dito ay ano daw, uh, mula ito sa ating guest from Alay Sining, um, paano po daw nakakausad kay papano ang mga uring magsasaka, ang mga pesante, uh, lalo na ngayong panahon ng pandemya? Ay, Kwan, mahirap eh, yung produkto ng mga magsasaka hindi na dadala o kaya yung mismo ng ano may pasilidad halimbawa yung national school authority na dapat nag-assure sa tamang level ng uh, sa tamang presyo pagkuha sa tamang presyo ng para ano mabuhay mga magsasaka at ano yung uh, mapabuti ang kanilang kalagayan ano yung hindi ginagawa um, ibig sabihin ni eh, Konyon um, may mas malaking kaysa yung ano yung bang Uh, restrictions ng movement hindi dahilan yan eh ang na na principal ang principal na dahilan yung mga importer ng rice ha ah? yung mag import gagamitin nila yung importation nila uh, para ano yung pam pam ano ito pang uh, to press down yung prices ng ano ng uh, kahit kahit ano kahit hindi mas mura yun talaga pero sa dami noon They can ignore yung ano local production uh, because they still have rice to circulate and in and, and in that case artificially they press down the way the you know the they press down the um, the the price of uh, locally produced rice they make the peasants local peasants uh, beg you know, and uh, because they have rice flowing from abroad you know? uh, so yan ang ano uh, lalong itong abuso na ito dati nang ginagawa manipulation ng mga big compradors na kasabwat ni Duterte at lahat, lalong nagagamit nila itong taktikang uh, marumi na ito uh, dahil sa kondisyon ng COVID um, pero ano maraming produkto ng magsasaka na talagang kailangan ng ano in, yung bang uh, sa kanilang paraan o sa iba't ibang paraan ng mga pati na local merchants dapat eh, ano yan madala yan sa ano sa mga urban areas pero ano may may epekto din yung restriction halimbawa yung mga gulay mula sa nabalitan ko yung mga gulay sa mula sa uh, sa uh, Benguet sa uh, Trinidad hindi ano uh, nahihirapan na dalhin dahil hinaharang uh, ay wag ko kung kasama rin yung pang pangingikil ng mga militar sa daan pero may mga patakaran sa ano sa sa quarantining na ano nakakahadlang sa movement ng goods kaya bagsak ng ekonomiya sa lahat ng aspeto dahil sa uh, itong sa covid at uh, na uh, pinatawan ng ano uh, paghihigpit ng Uh, militar at pagsasamantala na rin ng militar. Palagi ko kumikita ng militar yan sa ano, pag-control sa movement ng mga goods. Sige, uh, maraming salamat doon, uh, Kajoma. Uh, we, we have two more um, questions. Ang una dito ay sa so World Bank funded na parcelization ng collective cloas ay naaagaw pa ang dati ng distributed lands. Kasi nawawala ang mga original collective loas kahit sa records ng DAR. At basta na lang dinideklara na di kasali ang ilang occupied and tilled lands na wala pang mga individual titles pa. Dapat bang labanan ang parcelization? Ay talagang ano, problema yan sa bogus land reform. Yung uh, ano yan eh, ang, sa aking presentation ay yung redistribution price and Uh, ang uh, ang tinutunan ko kasi ano yon yung laging mataas yan eh dahil sa kilo, ano yung may sabwatan ng uh, government ano yun nasa sulok yung magsasaka at yung landlord at uh, government bureau para tang nag-uusap tungkol sa ano sa valuation ng lupa pagkatapos ano may administration cost 
ganito ganitong buhay na magsasaka eh. Kapag ano yung uh, may isang serious illness sa pamilya, gagastusan, ano na yung yung hindi na mababayaran na yung uh, yung ano, yung redistribution price na yan, kahit by installment, no? Pagkatapos kung ano naman, uh, uh, madalas naman yung natural uh, calamity, uh, isang calamity na ano nagresulta ng ano ng uh, crop failure todas yung ano yung installment plan sa pagbabayad kaya laging ano yan eh ang mga figures yan eh mataas eh yung non-payment uh, of the redistribution price at one um, umaabot ng 90% yata eh so ang na, uh, ang ilang nakapagbayad diyan yung ano pamilyang ano uh, may anak na Uh, kumikita may sumasahod elsewhere no o nag-abroad kaya ano yon nakukumpleto may nakakakumpleto naman no pero karamihan din nakakakumpleto yan uh, so yung uh, laging nauwi yung may kaibigan nga akong pan eh landlord na talaga willing siya na uh, next property ng lupa niya pero ang ang masama sabi niya ano yung hindi nakayanan ng mga magsasaka ng bay- yung mga tenants niya na bayaran kaya napunta sa yung sa kamay ng mga rich persons, mga merchant usurers at ilang smaller landlords, no? Eh, doon ano, yung vicious ano, nasa vicious cycle 'yan, yung pag hindi nakapagbayad na yung so-called land reform beneficiary, nauuwi yung lupa sa ano pa rin, uh, to what in the direction of land concentration. And uh, at first, of course, may intermediate stages. Nakita ko yan eh, sa, sa Bela Limbawa. Kaya na yung lupang libre, eh? yung lupang libre, uh, mag-go-homestead. Uh, may nag-go-homestead, akala kanila na yung lupang ano, maabot ng 8 hectares. Pero yung pala, military reservation yung, ano, pinag, yung, yung ano, binuksan na lupa. Pagkatapos, uh, bukod sa problema sa registration ng public land na yan as uh, an, uh, as uh, as an uh, property of the person who, who developed it from the forest yung ano uh, mga merchant usurer mga kunya eh uh, parang ahente ng landlordism yan eh um, uh, yung bang sila nagpapautang pagkatapos kanila na yung lupa mamaya sila na rin yung ano sila na rin yung ano maging small landlord hanggang lumaki halimbawa sa isang uh, sa isang lugar na alam ko yung umpisa niya ay rich peasant no kumo may extra cash uh, laging ano yun ibina, uh, ginagamit niya yung extra income to buy more land in a matter of 10 years ano naging landlord eh na naka 100 hectares so ganyan um kung ang, ang ganito pa na eh, kalagayan ng magsasaka uh, yung ano pa yung tenure na lang eh kwan uh, yung tenure na lang hindi maliwanag no uh, kasi kahit na may land reform yan eh uh, this classic feudalism still there no at kung wala kang tenure kung pwede kang sipahin eh? sipahin anytime by your ano, landlord no And then uh, all kinds of impositions can be made on you because of your helpless condition. Yeah. Um, so, linakihan ko yan eh. Nakikinig sa mga problema ng mga magsasaka. Uh, idinudulog uh, sa mother ko dahil mabait sa mga, uh, mga kasama namin. Doon ko nalalaman lahat yung problema sa pamilya, uh, sakit, pagkakasakit, problema sa crop failure, etc. Titiusap lagi na ano na bigyan ng extension o kaya mangungutang pa o huhingi ng gamot ganun. And so, iyan ang kalagayan ng magsasaka habang hindi uh, habang ang backward ng economy at um, walang ano, you know, walang outlet no for the surplus population and even for the surplus uh, that lay, the surplus product that agriculture produces yung surplus product na yan napupunta sa enlargement of uh, land holdings ng mga landlords o kaya uh, napupunta sa comprador, pakinabang ng mga comprador. Um, pati na yung mga 
uh, nag-abroad na no galing sa uri mong gagawa at magsasaka yung yung ano eh yung mga kita nila eh kuno eh. eh hindi na pupunta sa ano eh industrial development ng Pilipinas kundi sa uh, sa Henry C Empire yung uh, uh, ano to yung anong supermarket yan eh kaya numero uno ang si family yung SM uh, numero uno kasi yung uh, kinikita ng mga overseas contract workers pangkonsumo uh, ng mga ng mga pamilya ng mga contract workers eh may ano yan eh medyo maswerte na yun nakakabili ng tricycle para para uh, kumita karamihan niyan 95% yan na uwi sa ano sa pagkain ng gang pananamit at sa yung uh, pagsisikap ng mga pag-aral yung ilang members of the family kaya nakakulong ang Pilipinas under development kasi ano yun ang uh, anumang extra na uwi sa malaki sa uh, malaking comparador sa mga sendero hindi ano you know, walang outlet sa industrialization na yung outlet na yon uh, for further development na na nahaharang ng uh, kombinasyon ng malaking comprador, sendero at mga uh, corrupt no? na officials or, or bureaucrat capitalist. So, ano ba? Natunong ko ba? <laughs> Sige po. Uh, ito, meron tayong last na, ano, na, na question. Um, sabi dito ay sa peking modernisasyon ng pagsasaka, ang unang pumasok sa atin na mga reaper galing China ay mga bulok na at uh, panghakot na lang kaya palit ng palit ng mga models. Pero sa bawat reaper na dumating, halos 27 traditional manggagawang bukid ang mawalan ng kita sa lokalidad. Ano ang dapat gawin sa mga reapers ng Panginoong may lupa at mayamang magsasaka? Uh, alam niyo, may kilala ko na ano abang mga, mga ilang uh, landlord or whatever uh, level small medium uh, or big you know sa mga kabaganahan ko uh, mayroon pa yung gusto mag modernize ng traktor kahit na hiwa-hiwala yung lupa niya may may categorize mo one of the minor heirs sa aming kwan pamilya sa yung clan yung nagtraktora hmm? tapos sinusubukan niya no ano yun ang uh, yung traktora na ni inimported diyan na de, pag na depreciate na uh, naging ano um, yung ang importante diyan ay imported diyan at saka yung ha, no, may panahon na yung ha, nakukuha sa pon na bibili mula sa hapon yung ano hand tractors ha na uso yan Um, pagkatapos uh, uh, pero ganito ang pinakaambisyoso na, na plano sa mechanization ay ganito kay Benedicto sa panahon ni, Mar ni Marcos akala ni Benedicto pwede siyang gumamit ng harvester combines uh, kuba, tulad ng ginawa sa Thailand siguro yun ang kinukopya pero sa Thailand eh, yan, mas maluwag ang mga imperialista sa pagpapapayag eh, na ano na maging newly industrialized ang Thailand. Pero sa Pilipinas, ganito, uh, sa kaso ni Benedicto, ano, yung, man, eh, yung kumpanya niya na mag-introduce ng international, uh, international harvester ay nabangkrap, hindi nakausan. Dahil mas mura pa rin yung gumamit ng mga murang-murang ano, uh, yung sakada. Ano? yung na, sila na mismo nagdadala ng kanilang itak no para magtabas uh, so yung pro project na mag uh, in, mag uh, harvester yung integrated na ano uh, pag sa pagtanim sa pag ano ng functions ng agriculture hindi ano hindi nang develop kaya palagi ko uh, may palagi ko may hanggang uh, Um, rich peasant pwedeng ano eh mga has na bumili ng ano eh sa mechanical equipment na de motor no pero uh, iyan ay eh, kwan hindi produkto ng Pilipinas yan at kung na, na yung kinita sa agrikultura hindi sumapat no 
Ano yun? Uh, hanggang ma-depreciate yung equipment, mawawala. So, uh, hindi buo nga yung mga ginagamit na equipment, hindi buo nga ng uh, Philippine industrialization. Binabayaran pa rin ng, ano, ng uh, mga produkto na uh, masasabing kwan. Uh, hindi, hindi ano, yung Pilipinas pa rin sa madaling salita. Ano yun? Uh, hindi gumagamit ng sariling productive equipment na siya mismo gumawa. Yung Pilipinas hanggang hand tools ha? ang ma- ma- na nagagawa na ita. At saka ano, yung blacksmithing and uh, um, foundry made. No? Uh, yan ang ano, kakaya, kakaya ng Pilipinas. Pero machine tools hindi. Uh, machine tools and tools to produce uh, uh, tractors and uh, uh, other agricultural equipment hindi um, irrigation pumps etc. hindi nagagawa ng Pilipinas kaya ano yan matatawag mo na appreciable imported things um, and they don't ano, uh, they don't spell ano, yung mechanization modernization of agriculture Uh, may limit yan. I think uh, the old carabao is still very much alive, no? Uh, if you, if, uh, uh, kasi may mga tao na impress eh. Pagdaan ng nila sa highway, nakikita nila yung ano. Maaaring nakikita here and there, yung magamit ng, ng hand tractor o mismo tractor. Pakala nila uh, mod, uh, modernized na at uh, mechanized na ang uh, Philippine culture by and large it's the old carabao that is the most reliable ano um, uh, 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 productive force uh, na nagagamit ng mga magsasaka ay sa ano eh may ilang lugar sa Pilipinas nga na napaka backward yung yung agriculture eh, na ano yung tusok tusok na gagamit gagamit lang ng ano uh, ng uh, ano to ng uh, uh, ano yon yung uh, uh, kahoy na with sharpen point yun tinutusok tusok na ground para pagkatapos dun sila magano ng seeds In, dahil ano yun ay nasa ano na uh, nasa high grade na yung lupa kasi ang exhausted na yung kwan eh Ang problema ng Pilipinas kaya puputok niya ang Pilipinas eh dahil kuno eh yung uh, ang uh, kalupaan hindi nag-increase pero yung tao nag-increase. Kaya noong pang 1969 nagkonklusyon na uh, nagkonklusyon ang CPP na ubos na yung ano basically ubos na yung uh, forest region at yan din sinasabi ng gobyerno na sa high slope na um, so di uh, yung uh, ang makakalutas lang sa ano uh, kone ang figure as of uh, 60 uh, ang figure some uh, three decades ago 12 billion uh, hectares ng Pilipinas ang in increase lang 13.5 at saka yung mga uh, napalawak dahil sa lagging yung uh, nang nakakuha ng lag over areas yung mga ano eh, um, yung mga malalaking asendero at mga korporasyon na uh, ng mga komprador iyan ang kwan kaya yung uh, dumadami yung pam- magsasaka pero lumiliit yung ano yung kalupaan na magagamit at maaring pamumud sa kanila eh, isang problema yan kaya yung ano yung uh, pag pag de, Eh ngayon itong ano eh itong uh, itong aking presentation dito uh, nagpagawa ako ng kwan graphic representation ano yon yung sa base ay eh, magsasakan may kalabaw pagkatapos yung uh, malaking comprador na nakas- nasa Mercedes sports car at sa likuran niya ng mga nagtataasang building no ayan eh, ang uh, picture ng economy So ano, yung modernization wag mag wag magulat dahil yung ano, yung uh, surplus manufacturers ng um, more developed countries like Japan, Korea, China especially now, 
gahiganti yan na may um, surplus ba ng factors, ano yun? Uh, yung pwede pa nilang ibaba yung presyo eh, para magkaroon ng mga mga ano, mga uh, non-reproducible non equipment. Eh? Uh, basta subject to depreciation na lang over time sa Pilipinas. Uh, yung ano, talagang ano naman ah, yung pag yung uh, in neoliberal times sa kakagulat eh nung araw pag ma may makinilya ka na kunyan um, uh, halagang ano sweldo ng isang buwan yan siguro halimbawa uh, pero ngayon kalat yung ano kalat yung mga handis ng uh, mga cellphone etc uh, pero ano yan uh, resulta na yan ng ano yung sadyang ano pagdaloy ng financing para diyan pero um, the Philippines becomes a dumping ground for this consumer for this consumables for this consumer goods you know? pero yung productive capacity niyan hindi ano um, hindi yung um, modernization and mechanization by agriculture uh, connected with national industrialization hindi ganon uh, ay yung mga palamuti lang yan yung nakakapag uh, mga even rich peasant probably can afford at certain times sila lang kung may kam, may pa, may member of the family na kumikita uh, as contract uh, as overseas contract worker or may kwan relatively good nakapag-aral uh, makatulong sa magulang magyo-contribute pero hindi ano yun uh, palagi ko sakita ng rich person hindi kaya yung kuno eh, bumili ng ano modern equipment uh, ang mas gagawin ng rich person yan ay noon may extra kalabaw na ginagamit para ano ipaupa sa ibang sa mga uh, middle persons na ano o kaya ibang persons na walang walang work animal no so ganyan ang kalagayan sa Pilipinas kung talagang alam mo yung buhay sa barrio Po, maraming salamat uh, ka Joma sa pagbigay uh, po ng inyong uh, oras at uh, pagkakataon no upang makausap po kayo uh, sa tungkol sa mahalagang uh, paksang ito uh, medyo ano na tayo kapos na tayo sa oras dahil mag-automatic na cut yung ano yung zoom no in uh, in less than 10 minutes no so um sa puntong ito po ay um, nagpapahayag po ako no ng uh, ano ng aming uh, uh, in behalf of uh, content UP um Maraming salamat po uh, ulit ka Joma. Maraming salamat din sa kilos, salamat. Uh, kilosang magbubukid ng Pilipinas um, sa pag-co-sponsor pag ng ating uh, program um, ngayong gabi at uh, kaninang akahapon ito nagsimula. And um, kay Kapaeng uh, sa pagbahagi ng kanyang uh, re reaction at sa lahat no ng uh, ng ating uh, nakasabay no ang, ang ang lively ang daming mga ano mga mga tanong no and at least um, para sa akin personal personally mga maraming mga nalinaw na mga usapin no na palalim ang pagunawa sa katangian at kasaysayan ng semi feudalism sa Pilipinas um, ipapadala po namin ang uh, teksto at ang it, ang recording at ang PowerPoint um, sa sa lahat and um, uh, next week um, abangan po natin um, iba isa na namang um, session itong capsule critics uh, we will be uh, hearing from mom ano uh, Sara Rimundo ng uh, ng bayan uh, she will be talking about the topic na did somebody say we can't make a revolution on Trotskyism and um, other Eurocentric ideas. So maraming salamat ulit sa lahat. Uh, dito tayo magtatapos ngayong gabi. Uh, pero alam natin na tuloy pa rin no, ang ating laban para sa pambansang demokrasya at uh, na may socialist ng perspektiba. Uh, bago tayo mag-ending, baka may final words po kayo, uh, Kajoma, para sa ating audience. Uh, nagpapasalamat ako na uh, ako ay naging speaker sa webinar seminar uh, webinar series na ito. Uh, uh, sana um, nag, uh, nagkaroon ng kaliwanagan uh, uh, tungkol sa uh, ilang punto, tungkol sa problema ng uh, uh, ating bansa, uh, ang malakolonyal na ekonomiya, um, lalo na yung bahagi ng ano, 
na agrikultura, magsasaka. Uh, at uh, uh, inasang ko na sa uh, kaliwanagan na ma- maaaring nakuha, eh, mas makakilos ng uh, masigasig at mahusay ang mga kasamang uh, kumikilos um, uh, para sa uh, kapaktanan ng sabay ng Pilipino, lalo na mga uh, pinagsasamantalang uri. Maraming salamat po ulit at uh, kita-kits po sa, sa susunod na pagkakataon. End na po tayo. Bye-bye po. Salamat po.